Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Ben Reeves. Hey, what's up? And Andrew Reiner today. Hello, everybody. Oh, welcome to the big show. We got a lot to cover. This is, look, it's getting hot outside and gaming's getting hotter. Uh, first, we got Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order, Nintendo Switch exclusive. That'll be a fun one to talk about, I think. I don't really know your thoughts yet, Reiner. Uh, then we have Fire Emblem Three Houses. Uh, Kim has been playing oh. a lot of that game and she has a lot of strong feelings. She's uh, still in house one. That's right. She has yeah. not made it to the second house. Uh, then we talk about Gears 5's multiplayer, which Shay got to play. Very exciting. Uh, Grifflands and Nowhere Profit, two card game RPG type things. Uh, Leo's pumped about both of them. Yeah. Then, he has strong feelings. He really does. Then we have Sky, which is the next game from that game company. Isn't Ooh. it insane? This is technically their follow-up to Journey. How yeah, man, old is Journey? A long time. Journey came out 2012. Hmm. Holy crap, really? Yeah. yeah, don't you remember you were young Ben Reeves then we all called you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, my voice was going to make me a fortune then. <laughs> then we have community emails and then back half of the show. What's this? This must be a typo. We have an interview with Genova Chen talking about the development of Sky to figure out why the hell it took him so long to release uh, this mobile, beautiful little adventure game. Mm -hmm. um, so we learn all about that. Was it was, just like drugs? Or it was mainly drugs. Okay. No, that's not true. Yeah, he says there's like a big pivot in the middle of the game's development, which is interesting to kind of dive into. Hmm. Uh, he has a very interesting analogy where he says, originally we were making Sky to be like a roller coaster. Then we realized we needed to make it a full theme park. Okay. There's okay. An angle. All right. Uh, All right. Also, uh, Sky, so it's iOS only right now. It's coming to other platforms in the future. So he talks a little bit about that shift, what to expect from those other versions, yeah. which might be coming sooner than you think. Also, the idea of comparing any of his games to a roller coaster, I, I really like Journey a lot, mm -hmm. but like roller coasters may be a weird analogy, I well, feel like. Last time I, I kept think... putting the controller down and was like, Ooh, Woo, hands in the can't air. stop. Yeah. yeah, I remember last time we went to Valley Fair in Minnesota here, you kept chirping. <laughs> waiting for someone to join yeah, you. Yeah, where is everybody? I tried to <laughs> jump out of it and float <laughs> down. They wouldn't let me. Uh, also, because the guy's name is Genova Chen, uh, talked to him about the Final Fantasy VII remake and yeah. what he wants from Genova specifically <laughs> in that remake. And believe it or not, he has thoughts on it, which really? is very fun. Yeah, yeah. It's a Did great you time. know he was a fan before... He interview. named himself yeah. Genova. I would assume he's a fan. Yeah. Okay. okay. But I never have explicitly heard him talk about Final Fantasy VII, so fun chat. Cool. Stay tuned for that. Um, right now, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Yeah. Andrew Reiner, uh, so is your review on the site at the time of this podcast airing? Yes. Okay. But as of the recording, we don't have the exact review score locked down. Right. But... I'm still writing the review. Okay. But right now, how are you feeling about it? Uh, did you see Avengers Endgame? Yeah, one of the greatest uh, finales of all time. Cool. Greatest work of art of yeah, all time, I would up say. up there. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so <laughs> next we have Fire Emblem Three Houses. No. What do you think about uh, this? Uh, well, it is not that. It is not that level. It is not Very even the level of are. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1. I don't know if uh, we expected it to be in-game level, <laughs> though, going in. But. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's disappointing. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of technical issues, some balancing issues, some really befuddling design decisions. Oh, really? Um, the one thing it does really well, though, is that same thing that Avengers Endgame does of just, like, cramming as many characters into this story as possible. In a and, somewhat sane way? No, the story okay. is not good, but uh, it is fun to go through the level and be like, oh, who's going to be the next hero I get to play as, or the villain I take on, or... Who's even just making a, a, a small cameo? Yeah. Uh, and it's just constant. It's a barrage of, of these heroes and uh, deep dives into the Marvel Universe. Well, so Reeves, you've also beat it at this point? Oh, I haven't beat it yet, but I've been okay. playing it a, a fair amount. Okay. But and like I remember on the cover story trip, we were so blown away that it was like, hey, the second level, when you first go to Earth... It's just like, bam, introduction, bam, yeah. introduction. Yep. It just throws so many characters at you. Does it basically keep with that pace for yes. the rest of the keeps game? keeps with that pace. And oh, it's my God. almost jarring to a degree. Like, there's scenes where you're like, like, did I just black out and wake up an hour later? Like, it's like, what? from one scene to the next, it's very jarring and sometimes not very just connected. Just leaps in uh, not just logic, but also just location. Like, you'll be up in space. I don't want to give away... Uh -huh. Locations uh, for endgame stuff. Space is a location. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you'll be there, and then all of a sudden you're in Wakanda. Or, you know, it's like what? What it, just happened? Do here? they have that line where it's like, "Of course, we need to go to Wakanda," and then just jump cut? No, uh, it's just it's kind actually of there. more jarring than that. It's <laughs> like, yeah. So the overall story, it's like you know, it's a different version of Thanos and the Black Order. Is it interesting at all as a Marvel fan? I mean, he wants the Infinity Stones to do what is likely the snap, right? And uh, you're trying to stop him from getting those. And so you are trying to round him up as he is. And um, 
so that through line is is consistent and yeah there's there's this race going on but all the introductions all the environments you go to this I would hate to be the writer on this, trying to piece all that together. Oh, and so they, they struggled. Like, there's no heart or soul to this this story at all. It's just kind of like, here's a new character. You could play as him. That's that's kind of how it goes. And it's such a tough structure. Like, I feel that way, too. It's like, how do you make a compelling version where you're throwing all these characters in? And it's like, I feel like Lego did it not that long ago, right? Like, yeah, it's not yeah. impossible to make something that's just no, a little softer. Th- those Lego games don't get enough credit for their yeah. stories. Like, yeah, they're agree. fun and... There's an actual arc there. This just, it, it's just a mess. Uh, and it's unfortunate too, because I mean, we've had, you know, Spider-Man was such a great thing uh, from Insomniac Games. And I think everybody was hoping like Marvel can continue in a big way with, with you know, giving us new stories in the game space. But this yeah. is just more, just kind of like, here are the characters you know in a very kind of pedestrian way. They're not doing anything different with them. Right. But I think they do a good job of representing them. Of, okay. You know, like Cap seems like Cap. Some of their voices aren't the best, like Thor. <laughs> Whatever he talks, I'm like, oh. yeah. yeah I, you guys were playing in the office the other day and just hearing the sounds booming out of your TV. Stormbringer! And like, and yeah. my thunder! Just like the same lines over and over again. Yeah, and Christ. whenever they do the attacks, they call out the same thing. So you, it actually kind of helps as you're playing the game uh, to know what Reeves is doing. Like, just by the sound of it, like, because there's so much going on on screen at yeah. once, just chaos. You can't even keep track of it at times. Right. Um, but it, hearing we... those voices does help from a gameplay perspective. Okay. When and, we saw it for the the cover story, like that was one of the pieces of feedback we gave them. We were like, hey, I know you guys are only a couple months out, but if you could tone this down at all, that would really help us out. And I think that email got archived immediately. <laughs> it's a, it's I, the same it, level of it chaos. It feels on pretty much like just as chaotic as it was when we saw it, which okay. is kind of disappointing. Is that tough? So you played with two players. Is there a sweet spot? You can do four. Okay, you can do four. Do you recommend a, a certain sweet spot between one to four? No, I mean, it's always going to be a, a mess on that screen. And, and You always have four characters on screen because yeah, you always have right. like just the CPUs controlling the other characters. Yeah. And it's the gameplay is fun. Like, it, it is true to the Ultimate Alliance series. Uh, you know, you got two attacks you're alternating be- between. You have four special powers. You have this extreme attack, which... Sync attacks, which we can line up stuff together. Yeah. Nice evasive system where you can block or dodge roll out of the way of, uh, or just kind of side strafe out of the way of stuff. Yeah, it's Team um, Ninja. They know how to do some of that yeah, extra stuff and, well, Yeah, right? and that all works well, but then you start running into technical issues uh, where the camera will just all of a sudden just, I have no idea where my character is. It's like he's either like butted up against the wall when you have your hero camera, which you can rotate. Yeah, the closer one. Or if we're playing co-op, it's a set camera. And then all of a sudden it's just like too far out. Or, you know, if you're in handheld mode, your guys will just be like three pixels high or four pixels high. It's like, is that Daredevil? I had a couple times where like the camera was so stretched out and I was like a foot away from a guy. I was trying to attack him, but like I couldn't go any further because the camera was, Uh, we'd reached the limit. And they're like, ah, he's right there. (laughs) And then, (laughs) uh, frame rate issues like you wouldn't believe when you oh, have it docked really? and you're doing uh co-op that way like we're in a big boss battle and remember i won't uh, reveal who this boss is uh but we're in this boss battle and we <laughs> synced up our uh, extreme attacks and it looked like the frame rate got down to like 10 um you use the time stone <laughs> and <laughs> oh is that what we did <laughs> oh we were using the time stone yeah right uh the x-men legends games and ultimate alliance games were heavy on destruction yeah so you're just going through those environments just breaking down every wall like yes it's true the avengers probably wouldn't do this level of property damage Uh but it was fun to do that knock down walls smash computer terminals to get items and and gold and whatever uh this game the levels are very sterile sometimes you'll see a couple boxes or a fern you could go destroy to get items and, and coins but mostly it's just like kind of a very straight path with no interaction whatsoever uh and the level designs become a problem very quickly it's just like oh there's nothing going on here team ninja knew that so they throw in periodic puzzles which are not good oh no puzzles uh, are probably the worst part yeah just, oh just man just like just hard or stupid you'll just run into a room that will have like 10 force fields and yeah. it goes top down viewpoint really stretched out and you got to hit a terminal to see which force field comes down and you got to make your way through this like rat maze okay it's like it's kind of what tedious. was that yeah like uh, puzzle solving yeah. Or moving, like pushing a block uh, onto a, a a little switch that will open a door, like figuring out that kind of thing. It's like, uh, what is this? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
The worst part of the game, though, yeah. is you're, it, as awesome as it is, they keep throwing new heroes at you. Uh, your your roster of characters, the characters on your bench, are not gaining experience or levels as you're going through the game, and right. the game progressively gets harder. So what happens is you start the game with the Guardians of the Galaxy. All of a sudden, you're getting all these Spider-Verse characters and mm-hmm. all these other characters thrown at you, and you want to play as them. And they are, when you get them, they are leveled to whatever level you're on. So, like, you might uh-huh. get Spider-Man at level, let's say he's level six, right? So you can immediately start playing as him. But the characters you were playing as go sit on the bench. They're not getting experience. Mm, so no. before long, you either have to just keep playing as the new characters or keep playing the same characters just to maintain the levels for the new challenges. Where do they want you to go? Because what are those things called? Not infinite missions or whatever they're called? Infinity. Infinity. So what they have, and this is so strange, is periodically through a level, you will you can go left or right, and let's say you go left or find a hidden area, you'll find this fracture in time or space, uh, which is an infinity challenge, an tr- infinity trial, they call them. You can go into that, but what it does is you click it, and then it gives you a warning that you're leaving your story campaign, and you're going to the this challenge and then you're going to be kicked out to the main menu. So you go in there, if you can complete it, you'll get experience, like items that you can use to level up characters. Yeah. Uh, but then you get kicked out to the main menu. You go back in to continue your campaign, level up the characters. And then if you want to, like, let's say you want to use, let's say most of your characters are level 20 and you want to get your spider going up to that and she's level eight or whatever. You're going to have to go and just replay old levels or go through these challenges if you have them. Because uh, the challenges are also level gated. Like it'll be like, this is a tough one. You need to be level 30 mm-hmm. to be in here. So yeah. you cannot just throw Spider-Man into, Spider-Gwen into that at that point. Basically right. a lot of grinding. It's a lot of grinding. And then what we ran into is we were trying to do local play. And I was in toward the end game and Reeves wasn't quite there yet. And it wouldn't let us play together. Because he had not got to my environment. I hadn't yet. gotten to his level yet, so you can only or play up to whatever yet. level you are in co-op. Oh, interesting. Which is, which feels archaic in a sense too. Right. Like I know games used to do that, but it's just like kind of. I thought we were past that. And one alternative is, which I, I tested and it didn't work very well, is I would have three characters that are high level, and then I'd throw in one of the low ones to like power level mm-hmm. as I'm going through the environment. But then you get to a boss fight, which is challenging. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to restart that. Yeah. They do give you these like experience cubes, which are like drops that you can like like use on a person and gives them a boost of experience. But again, that's what you get from the infinity challenges or finding hidden chests, like going off the beaten path to yeah. find chests. Sometimes there'll be a wall you can't destroy and you need specific powers to be able to knock it down. So you need to have specific characters. It's just dumb luck that you might have those characters with you. And mm-hmm. so they give you those items, which I think was their idea of like, oh, if you want to like level up somebody who's low level, but the, the trick is again, like it's kind of hard. So you kind of want to use those on your, your guys who are already good to boost them up even more. Yeah. So Reeves, I went back and played the first game when we were going on that cover story trip and I did not have a great time with that. It's like, I understand people are nostalgic. Yeah. I love that game and that's great. But going back to it, it was a little bit rough the first time. Yeah. Do you feel like it's close to that? In terms of fun, like, is there any just base level fun to be had for just, I don't know, teaming up with friends, just bashing your way through the right. Marvel Universe? Because I feel like that's what that first game ultimately was. It's definitely was. Mo- more fun with fun, uh, friends, more fun with friends. But I, I, you know, I played those original games solo as well, and I had a lot of a good time. More more fun than I'm having now. And I would say those old games were, like, big stupid fun. Yeah. If that makes sense. And I would probably use one of those adjectives for this game, <laughs> but uh, I won't say which. Uh, I, and it's disappointing. And yeah. it's, it's partly, it's like the gameplay is monotonous in a way, in, in more ways than this one, than it was in the past. If really? That makes sense. You like, feel it's less, a lot of button mashy. And you feel less of a connection to the world. Yeah. Like, I really do feel like, like Wakanda is really bad in terms of just like the flow of enemies. Like there's these, it's almost like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle villains, like these ninjas right. that are colored. <laughs> they're like wearing Color colored coding. outfits. So it's like there's purple snipers up on the ridge uh-huh. and they can like one or two hit Captain Marvel. And so it's like it becomes a thing where you go in an environment and you the camera's in a way where you don't even know there's snipers there. And all of a sudden we're getting picked off and it's like, okay, we got to find these things. Mm-hmm. But we're tethered. So we're like pulling each other around. Every um, superhero's fantasy. Yeah, it, <laughs> these it, games have just... gotten progressively simpler too, because the the old X Men Legends games, you were like leveling up and kind of 
picking your character's stats a little mm-hmm. bit and just like now it's just they level up the stats automatically go you don't you can kind of like level up each power but you only have four of them yeah. So it's not like you're choosing a whole lot there. This is it's, a bummer. Yeah, I feel like there's but, a wrong way to go with that. Yeah, and there, you know, we're being pretty hard on it here, picking on the, the problems it has, which it has. And there is some fun to be had, though, in getting these characters and playing as them. Some of them are done really well, like Ghost Rider. You know, you do oh, his yeah. extreme. He has his bike, and he yeah. launches in the air and flames everywhere. And then something like Doctor Strange, where it's like, he has a flame attack that's exactly like Ghost Riders. So it's like, what... What is that? Like, huh. uh, some of them are better than others, but just getting the characters, meeting them, seeing how they're presented, Team Ninja did a good job with that. Okay. But the game itself is laborious and often uninteresting and uh, kind of a mess. I mean, yeah. if you're a huge Marvel zombie and all you want is like, I want to see my characters interact and you know smash things together with mm-hmm. my friends, like maybe there's some fun to be had there right. for those specific people. But like... I don't know, casual fans who like just left in game and are like, oh, I'd love to check out this this game because I love video games. I'm like, ah, I don't know. Maybe check it out first. <laughs> it but might it, not be for you. Yeah. It's not just Avengers. You know, it's Avengers, X-Men, Marvel Knights, yeah. Spider-Verse, uh, Fantastic Four is coming in the fall. That's super exciting, yeah. Uh, so it is a deeper dive than, than the MCU, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's just it's okay. fairly disappointing. Reviews on the site. Yes. Interesting. Read it. Uh, if you're interested in a good game to play on your Nintendo Switch, maybe you should stay tuned for the next section. Uh, do you guys want to clap out? Yeah. Love you. Oh, Lord. We have JV Gwaltney. Hi. And Kimberly Wallace. Hey, hey. Welcome to the big show. Hey, hey. Oh, boy. Oh, it's an exciting time. JV's wearing a Deathloop t shirt. It's a really good font. It's a very it's good a very font. It's a very good font. Yeah, that's, that's basically the reason I wear it. Do you ever lose sleep at night thinking about if a game were to be canceled that was shown at E3? I wonder how high Deathloop is up at that list. Like, you mean like. W- and disappointment? No, no just I think like the potential to be. Oh, canceled. the potential. Yeah. What do you think? Odds right now that Deathloop will never be released, I would put it at like six percent. Oh, I was thinking like yeah, like three out of ten. Three out of ten. Yeah. Okay. A little bit higher. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It's a bold vision like and think a confusing of like vision. All of the things, all of the properties that Bethesda has that they put money into, mm-hmm. like if one were to get cut. Right. I feel like that one. Like, if uh, something disastrous had happened, that would be at, like, the top of the list. But yeah, I feel like sure. they had enough people talking about it at E3 yeah. that even if it's totally isn't that great, there's still enough, like, interest around it that it would come out, is my opinion. That they would make yeah. something of it. Yeah, they would play try, mobile because game. so many people have already oh. talked about it, I feel like they would try to push to make it into something yeah, regardless. Yeah, that's a fine theory. If nothing ever happens again, we have this really cool font. <laughs> it's a great font. It's a hell of a loop. You say, my, my shirt is just death loop. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Exactly. Like, we are all on a death loop. Yeah, <laughs> you really think about it. Yeah. Uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses, yes. Kim. Yes. This is a tricky one to talk about right now, but there's a preview embargo that's up for this. And yes. it's fair to say you've been playing a lot of this game. Yes, I have been a very, very busy late nights okay. playing, but getting to know my students and, you know, li- guiding them on the right path, which is what this is all about. So you play the role of a teacher on this Nintendo yes. Switch exclusive. Yeah, it's actually, it's so brilliant because I never really thought about how well the teaching dynamics fit into Fire Emblem because you're constantly like, you know, trying to boost people's stats and turn them into the class that you want. And so as a teacher, you kind of get to guide that because you get to instruct your students so you can go there and like be like, I want this student to focus, you know, on his sword craft and, you know, add extra. And if you encourage them, you get extra little bonuses to that experience towards it. So it's really fun to be to kind of decide you get this uh, group of students and you kind of get to decide what path they're going to go on. Like, oh, I want this person to totally be like my tank and take all the damage and so forth. And <laughs> JV, you're a teacher. That's what it's like, right? Uh, like, exactly. You'll be my tank. You little prepare student, baby. Your You kids are my archer. <laughs> for the battle of life, basically. Yeah. And that's what it is. And it really, what makes it so great is the relationships in the game just get so enhanced by it. Like Fire Emblem has always been really cool because you could kind of pair characters together on the battlefield and then you get to do those support conversations and see how they grow as not only battle mates but teammates so uh-huh. um 
uh, battle mates and friends. Sorry, I meant to say that. But <laughs> battle it, mates with benefits. Well, not always. They can oh. still just be friends, but you get to see how they like initially would start off maybe not liking each other, and then as they get on the battlefield together and they help each other, then they're like, oh, you know what? You're Bonding not so bad. over murdering people. Yeah, ex- boy, look that, at all that. That's, I mean, that's, that's all a fire emblem about. about. Yeah. To be fair. Okay, hang on a second. Can you romance students then, or are you just playing a weird matchmaker as the teacher? Uh, there's a little... I'm not at the point in the game right now to say whether or not I can fully, but you, there is a time skip that they've talked about, and so it insinuates, and I have had a lot of flirtations going on that you can um, eventually... But oh, so wait, five, so the students will there, catch up to you? There's is a that five the year time skip. Um, you get to you do the part one that they've talked. They've talked about this, so it's not anything that's a big secret or anything. Okay. But um, and you can kind of see your students pair off a little bit as they get to know each other. Hot and heavy. Uh, JV, you love Fire Emblem. I remember we talked I, about the 3DS yeah, thing. Yeah, no, it's one of my favorite series. Specifically like Awakening, that's top of the heap for you? Oh, yeah, Awakening is like the best one. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kim. I'm looking into your eyes. Is Awakening still the best one? Yes. Oh, interesting. Right. I like some of the well, older ones too, but Awakening just did so much for that series and still stands as like... And I feel like this one is kind of taking an approach with awa- that Awakening did where it's changing things up, but it's changing them up in a really interesting way. And uh, fans are just going to really enjoy being able to like take this the school thing. It's just so brilliant. Okay, hang on. Yeah. Is it, what can you say? Is this game good or not? Oh, Okay, uh, <laughs> I am loving my time with it right there now. There we go. There we go. I will say, like, you know, I've enjo- the way that it's set up is a really engaging loop because you go and you kind of teach your students. You have, like, little social events that you, you can take them out to tea, which the tea stuff's a little weird. I'll give it that. But Wait, what kind of weird? You can have tea parties with them. And so you pick the tea and you have to keep the conversation going. And if you get the conversation going long enough, all of a sudden you can just observe them and just like go in <laughs> and uh, it's kind of creepy. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's Stop. real what? weird. It's Wait, real what are we creepy. Talking about? Okay. It's real creepy. So you keep a conversation rolling long enough and then you can just start observing them? them? Yes. It's weird. What it's the mean? worst. It's the worst part about the game, honestly. Like, it's the one thing that, like, even how the tea parties are structured with the conversations, it's a little bit of a guessing game. You kind of have to really get to know each student to see how far you can go in with the conversations. But yeah, it's just like you can look at them from all angles up close, and then if you click a button, like they'll say something about like, "Oh, you noticed that scar on my face," or like, "Yeah, there's just oh, you noticed my genitals. You, you went that okay. You don't. You do oh, not look at that. It's from the." The, you know, it's classy. It's okay. Classy. It's 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 tea, but uh, the tea parties are very, like I didn't like the I don't like them right now, but they're very beneficial to like enhancing your relationships. So you kind of want to do them. Uh, huh. JV, what are you looking forward to at this game? <laughs> None parties. of those bits. Uh-huh. Uh, no, like I really do like. I feel like we haven't had a good Harry Potter game yet. Like we've Ooh. had solid Harry Potter games, and from what I played at E3, because I played an hour at E3. Uh, even like the castle itself, it's Hogwarts as hell. Is it, yeah. Kim? Yeah. Yeah, like it's. It seems like there are scenes that deliberately like mimic certain parts of the movie versions of the castle. Like the hall where you eat with your students, straight up looks like the hall in Hogwarts. Yeah. That's fun. It, it's shameless. So I think that's my favorite aspect of it. Besides, like I always love Fire Emblem's uh, brand of strategy. Yeah. Mm. Um, and as someone who was a former teacher, I'm very interested to see how that plays out. The student stuff kind of creeps me out because at least uh, when I was being trained to be a student, they had lots of rules of like... you Trained al- to be a teacher. Yeah. Okay. You always keep your door open. Like your office door, when you're meeting with students, you always meet in public uh-huh. just so there's never like any like un- misunderstandings or like, gro- like gross shitty stuff. Like, uh-huh. Kim's kind of talking about Never here. lead your okay, students well, in the battle. Wanna, yeah. I'll say this. It's not... There's only a few times, tea parties and stuff, that it becomes... Like, your students will sometimes flirt with you, but it's never, like, something you are, like, encouraging or, right. you know, felicitating or anything. And uh, really, what it feels like is it just feels like you're kind of sitting there as, like, 
just guiding them, you know, getting them to close to what they need to do to be on the battlefield and survive, which is very big stakes. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing, too. Having been a teacher, like, obviously, Fire Emblem, it, it's optional, but there is permadeath. I mean, it just makes the permadeath hit so much harder when you I lose a student because yep. you're like, oh, f- <laughs> I've n- I don't think I, I no. I did one playthrough without permadeath on, but every time I play Fire Emblem, it's always like even the ones that make it optional. It's always with permadeath because those stakes are so good. I'm so fun. I'm also just surprised with how big the game is. I wasn't expecting like as much as there is to do, and also just having the branching paths are very interesting because you start out and you pick between three houses. So you have your choice that you can make. I chose the Black Eagles because I'm dark inside. But no, um, I like- Realistic is because you like the Blackhawks. And yeah, Chelsea, thank right? you, thank you. No, okay. actually, I, when I'm like, when in doubt, pick the female character. So there's the, she's the leader. Let me see how to say this. Edelgard, Edelgard, Edelgard. So it's just a hard <laughs> name to say. Don't say it three times. Yeah, oh God. Uh, yeah, they say it in the game, and I'm like, it sounds like it just rolls off the tongue so easy, and then every time I try to say her name, <laughs> it doesn't quite turn out that way. But, um, you know, picking that decision is kind of hard in the beginning. You get, like, maybe about an hour, half an hour to an hour in, depending on how fast you go through the dialogue stuff, where you can kind of sit there. And I remember being on the screen, and there's there's pros and cons to all of them. So, like, the one I picked, they're um, focused on magic, so you have better magic. Others, archery. Others, sword. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, you also have different students in there. So like with one, I really liked all the students' backstories. And I kind of was like, well, maybe I want to pick them because you are really shaped. Like you get really close with your class. It's not a decision that's like, hey, I'm going to do this. And it's I'm kind of just going to get to know everybody. You can recruit people from other houses if you want to, which yeah. I definitely did. But it's like you are really locked in with this group. So you kind of got to like them a little Mm -hmm. bit too so that was the other thing and then one house like I really there were a few people I really was like oh yeah I really want to get to know that character but I can't stand this leader because he's just like generic super like the typical hero you would see and so I wanted something different but I mean everybody will go into this like having different reasons for who they choose it's gonna be the type of thing when this game comes out and when does it come out by the way uh next Friday yeah okay that's gonna be the thing when it comes out everyone's gonna be arguing about why their their school is the best or how do you frame that yeah like who is the best I said we should do a video or just debate each other on it after every pe- oh other people play uh, and it's hard because like I said I I didn't expect it to be I was like oh is this going to be one of those decisions that's kind of like oh we'll give you a decision but it's not really that big of a right, deal no right. you are like with this class and you really build up a camaraderie and then also as you go on there are some decisions that will branch the story that I, I've i had multiple saves because I wanted to see just how much like it actually does change and there are definitely Different paths. So you're going to be replaying this game. Yes, you get the full and that's what is like so crazy to me is like the game is good on its own, and then I think I immediately want to replay this game once I finish just oh to see God. the other houses and paths. And yeah. it's just it's been crazy to think how much effort they put into you know doing all the different characters in each house because each house doesn't have just like two or three characters. I mm-hmm. mean, like you're close on the ten mark on them, uh, ten classmates, whatever. And then it's just like on top of that. Whew, it's crazy, and it's so smart that they're taking this approach and just, hey, it's one game, buy it. Because I feel like with Fates on the 3DS, mm-hmm. everyone was confused about, like, wait, what which is Which one this? do I buy? Which, yeah. Yeah, and then there's more that are releasing. I feel like they started with the idea in Fates. Like, let's kind of create get two, like, different games that feel very different but are, like, kind of still connected. And then with that, everyone was like, well, I don't want to purchase one or the other, as you said, like, mm-hmm. trying to decide. And with this, it's all in one, and there's just, there's a lot to the game I'm I'm really excited to figure out like see more and after my playthrough start up with another house immediately and just see how that kind of the vibe of that house is different from the one I did yeah not to be too reductive about it but as far as like branching choice quality from what mm-hmm. you've played so far Bioware Telltale about how oh hmm. god this is this is interesting because um, you will see, how do I put this? There will be different scenes in different parts of the game. And like, I'm trying to be careful because I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but I'll just say I was surprised by how the different directions that the game can go in. And the choice is actually being super in- interesting and smart. And just even me sitting there on the screen being like, 
I don't know what to pick. I'm conflicted. I. But you feel informed about your choice? Yeah, I feel like okay. I'm informed. I feel like they're doing a good job of balancing like these relationships you built versus like, well, what's good for the great, what's for the greater good? Mm-hmm. And so you're kind of sitting there like you're like, oh, my students are kind of everything to me right now. And then being having to choose like, what if your student does something you don't agree with? I mean, there's stuff like that that okay. goes on throughout the game that's really interesting. And I heard they changed up the battle system so it's no longer like the classic Fire Emblem Triangle right. anymore. Yeah, it's not the classic triangle it matter there's two things that go into it so weapon type still does matter some enemies will be certain weapons will work better on them than others um but it's also um unit type it it goes into account for it so maybe like armored enemies um you know some characters are better against them versus others or even with your weapon type within them like some an iron sword will work better than a steel sword and vice versa Mm -hmm. um so that's cool and then there's also the introduction of battalions which you can have your group like command you hire them and you can do this special battalion attack which is good because you do not take a lot of damage doing those and you can usually knock people out um, rather than just being on your own so that's good. And then there's also combat arts now, which uh, they pack more of a punch usually. As you get on, it, it feels like it's not as much. But uh, but your weapon durability takes a hit. So maybe, too, you can also, like, hit somebody from a farther point as an archer than you'd normally be able to use them. So you'd like, oh, I want to take this guy out anyways early. But uh, there's, a, like, a sacrifice to doing that. Okay. From... And Kim, you can disagree, obviously, since you've played more. But from what I played at E3, it very much felt like like the easiest way to think of the weapon system in earlier Fire Emblem games is rock, paper, scissors. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is leaning towards more sort of like total war enhancements, making things a little bit more complex. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But still, if you're new to Fire Emblem, the game very much has made this... Um, you able to like you can still see the forecast of like what your move's going to do ahead of time so you know like okay if i put this guy here he's going to take at least 10 damage yep. but that's okay cuz i have my healer by or whatever yeah um so that's good cuz it's like it's complex in its own way but not the way that the game works it makes it almost feel like well i ki- i'm seeing the math and the systems before i make the decision also if you make a mistake there is a thing called a uh, divine order where you can turn back your turns a few so it's you not can in real life baby you can not save use it. you yep. can save somebody if you want to mm-hmm. um, so if you do have permadeath on and you're just like I cannot lose that student, and I do not want to restart the battle. Because, again, these battles can get really lengthy. They can like how go, long are we talking? I've had some go all the way up to, like, uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Wow. When, especially when you get into the game. Like, it starts off, and it very much is a good, like, progression of, like, leading you up battles go fast. And then as you go on and the stakes get higher, so do the battles and so do the turns. So it's very easy when you're doing a long battle like that to accidentally, like, overlook and make a mistake. But at least you have that to, like, go back on yeah. if you yeah. want to. Like the final battles and, like, awakening and fates could take up to more than an hour. Oh, wow. Depending on how many units That's what, I was you actually had. just playing, like, one of the long ones before I came here. And I was joking with Ben. I'm like... I was just making sure we were on time for the podcast because uh, I was really getting into it. So, yeah, because I don't like to step away once I'm in it because you just will lose track of like we're all year. But I feel like I feel like it feels easier to me than past games. But maybe that's just because I play a lot of strategy RPGs at this point. And um, I just feel like because it lays out what the systems do and everything and it makes it very easy for you to make your decisions. Um, to me, right now, based on e- like even early, I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is going to get more difficult. Yeah. And the battles, as you do go on, I mean, I've had ones where I'm finally like, damn, if I don't watch what I'm doing, like my guy is just gone in one hit, but it... <laughs> Then you have to walk back to the empty classroom and still right, teach. Right. What do I do uh, here? Well, thankfully, like I said, you and you can also recruit people. Sometimes an option may come up where you're in battle, and somebody's like, "Don't kill me, I'll join your group." So you have. <laughs> I'll go to school. I swear, yeah, I'll, go I'll go to, to school. school. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting <laughs> like that. Weird. Uh, would you know when your review is going to be hitting the site? Yes, it will be Thursday morning. I believe it is 9 a.m. Central Time, so okay. 7 a.m. Pacific. Okay, so. very specific. Um, okay, let's let's use our imaginations here. Let's imagine Game Informer's end of the year meeting for 2019, oh, God, top 50 game of the year discussions. If you had to guess, will you guess that somebody or more than one person in that room will be making a case for three houses? Oh, yeah. 
definitely. Oh my god! All I right, mean, I might. I'm it, it, ar- I'm already just like. I'm very impressed myself, and I was saying to JV and Kim, I'm like, oh, this could go high. Um, this could be my. It might. So right I don't know. Now, I'm not done yet. You're but... not done yet, but the score in your mind now is like. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's very. Helpful. No doubt about it. Actually, I feel very confident that this one. I I like it. It's very good. Leo in the booth. The first eleven out of ten. It's confirmed right here. <laughs> this is very exciting. <laughs> it sounds like it, All right. right? Kim, you gotta walk back to your house and uh you're one of three. I houses. gotta finish that battle. Finish that thing. All right, good luck. Do you wanna clap out of here? Yeah, let's Kim. do it. Bye. Brian Shea. You're not yes. Kim. <laughs> you're hardly Kim in <laughs> any way. Uh you were just saying uh before the podcast started that Mario Maker Two is your game of the year. <laughs> so far, yeah. So far. Yeah. Leo, how are you, how are you enjoying Mario Maker Two? I'm not playing it. <laughs> I'm really I, enjoying it. Are you enjoying it too? I, I like making levels. Uh, I don't like Mario that much. So I'm the guy that you want making the Mario levels, obviously. Because they're just like torture traps or what? Is, no, I don't do the Dan Riker, Patrick Klepek thing. I would like try to make cool little fun levels. But do you feel like because you don't have as much of that Mario lexicon in your brain that the levels are a little bit different than you'd expect? Yeah, I think I think honestly the most interesting thing about Super Mario Maker 2 for me is that it's making me appreciate Mario in a way I didn't expect. Like I'm approaching Mario as like, oh, this is like this question block. I can use this as bait or a trap or blah, blah, blah. So seeing all of the familiar elements of Mario as like tools in an arsenal. Yeah. That's sort of where like my appreciation is coming from. And also, you just recently played Mario World for the first time. Yep. Ooh, I just did that a couple years ago. What yeah. do you think of that thing? I think there are some bullshit levels towards yeah. the end, but I think it's a good game. I think I, I don't think there's ever been a game that I've played where I've been like, wow, this looks like a child's coloring book, you know, in terms of like how, like it, like it is so focused on certain elements that it's like wacky and colorful and gleeful and like the mix of colors and how vibrant they are are perfect. But Wait a minute. Like, you should check out Yoshi's yeah, Island. Yeah, I was going to say, have you played Yoshi's Island? <laughs> no, I've never played Yoshi's oh Island. Oh my God. Jump Speaking into Yoshi's of a Island, children's coloring book. Oh, I think it's better. I don't think it's better. Okay. However, I think it's better. However, the, it's totally a children's coloring book. Okay, I'll check it out then. You should also check out a children's coloring book. <laughs> you really like it. I don't it's kind of like Mario. Uh, you're also playing through all of the Metroid games? What's yeah. Your, really, really, did you play like the original Metroid? I played all of the 2D ones. Yeah. For the first time? Yeah. Jesus. What is kicking this off? What's wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> Slashed right with you, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I was a Sega Genesis kid. Yeah. More of like my parents picked one console out as opposed to me like getting to like pick one. Mm-hmm. So and I then grew they up, put horse blinders on you exactly. which I thought was too much. Uh, so I grew up with, a, I didn't play any of the Super Nintendo games growing up. So like for the past two or three years, I've been like, okay, I should really go like play a link to the past especially after we voted it the greatest game of all time did you play it then uh no like i played it like uh like two months ago like oh, okay. i started with super mario world moved on to a link to the past and then did super metroid and like all three of those games are really great but super metroid it's amazing like you have people who are like mario people you have people who are pokemon people and so on and so forth. I feel like growing up, if I had played Metroid, I would. But that would have been my Nintendo thing. Well, dude, Aliens, your favorite movie of all time. Yeah, right. right? Like, of yeah. course, you're gonna like the tone <laughs> yeah. and the vibe of Metroid. Yeah, I know. But even more than that, I think I really like the design. Like the idea of like this planet is just a labyrinth that mm-hmm. you have to navigate, and then you know, getting power ups and stuff to proceed through the labyrinth. Like I had played like 20 Metroid likes before I played <laughs> right, this right. one. So uh, like Guacamelee, I don't really like Guacamelee or or anything like that. Uh, but something, something about Super Metroid, like even beyond like the alien stuff, like to me that game's just perfect. How, are, did you do Zero Mission? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would definitely recommend yeah, that. Zero over. Mission, Fusion, Super Metroid, all the 2D ones, basically, mm-hmm. and Samus Returns, which is like 2.5D. I guess. Did you enjoy Samus Returns? Yeah. Going. I think it's on the lower thing? end of like the games that I played and enjoyed, but like yeah. it's, you know, it's really good. It's a really good time. And you wrote a Virtual Life, which is your column, uh, yep. all about playing Super Metroid. Mm. Is it basically just a review of Super Metroid, or what's the what's the? <laughs> no, it's it's thing? just the experience of like, oh, I didn't play these games growing up. Do they hold up out of outside of nostalgia? Right. right. Yeah, and so it's more of like a critical approach to like Super Mario World and a link to the past and then Super Metroid, which takes up like three fourths of the article because I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Let's just talk about the good one. Yeah. Which yeah. is funny because the weekend before you wrote that article or like pitched it to the group, I had an idea which was like the inverse of that, which is like looking critically at the games that I grew up with, uh-huh. like Mario World and Sonic 3 and games like that, where it's like, all right, outside of nostalgia, do these games hold up? I'm and you're going to lobotomize yourself? Or yeah, you curious. can't get out of it. It's nostalgia. hard. I was yeah. thinking about how I could do that. You but can't. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I've definitely had that idea when I was a freelancer of like, I should go back to playing Half Life and see if it holds up. It still does, except for Zen. We don't talk about Zen, but uh-huh. like, it is really hard to sort of like break yourself away from like that kid when oh, you yeah. played it. Like, I bet if I hooked your brain up to some crazy machine, uh, which I'm planning on doing in a little bit, just hearing like the boot up sound for Half Life, yeah. it's just like dopamine avalanche. Oh, the right? menu, the little menu sound, like yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. it. It'll make you so happy. I mean, that's why I listen to those old soundtracks. Like whenever I'm doing like proofing and stuff, it's like I always just turn on like Mario World or Sonic Two or whatever, like mm-hmm. those soundtracks, and just listen to them and it, it brings me right back while I'm proofing. It is absurd. Like every old game that I'm thinking about replaying, especially like early PlayStation era stuff, it's like, I really feel like you're better off just watching highlights on YouTube and listening to the soundtrack. Like I probably will be better off with my life if I never replay Chrono Cross because I love Chrono Cross so much, but like just listen to the soundtrack for the rest of my life. It's going to be a quicker, much better feeling of everything that Chrono Cross meant to me as a kid, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. it's... It's been interesting to see games that I've tried to go back to and haven't really like made it all the way through. Like even some of my favorite games of all time, uh, it feels like Mass Effect Two is really the only one on like my top ten that I can go back to, and Resident Evil Four, where it's like, yeah, I can commit myself to playing through this for like three days and be done with it and love it and not feel like tired by the process at all. Like I just love this so much, as opposed to like there being bits where it's like I don't really want to do this. You yeah, know? and well, Wolfenstein. And you said you're gonna be playing Metroid Prime next. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious I, how mm. that holds up. Yeah, me too, because uh, I'm curious about how the switch from 2D to 3D in first person is. Yeah, but like I bought like a uh, AV to HDMI converter and stuff just to do it. So oh, really? Wow. Fun. Yeah. Well, you bought a Game Boy Advance SP just to play yeah, all the Metroid like, games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was fun. So you're going all in on this. Yeah. Jeez. Are you going to be writing about Metroid Prime then? We'll find out. I think it's a fascinating time, because I'd imagine Nintendo is sitting on that very heavily rumored... Metroid Prime HD trilogy, right, for the Switch. Mm-hmm. They're probably just waiting for God. the Metroid Direct when they can start pushing Metroid Prime yep. 4 and save it for ammo for that. But it's so frustrating to be like, I would love to replay Metroid Prime right now. And look, you're buying a converter, for Christ's sake. Yeah, no, like, there was, there was like a week where I was like, I'll just wait, because I talked about it with Andy, because his favorite game of all time is like the original Metroid, mm-hmm. I yeah. think. Uh, we were having a discussion about it. And I was like, I think I'll wait. I think I'll wait just till the Switch version gets announced because we know it's on the way. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't know, no, but, you know, it seems like, like it's so. coming. It's obvious it's coming. Uh, but then a week went by and I went to Andy. I was like, I'm ordering the converter <laughs> and I'm just going to play it. I'm just going to hook up the GameCube and play it. Yeah, do it. Uh, you know what reminds me of Metroid Prime? What? Gears 5. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> in see. that it's a video game. Um, things happen underground in a planet. You shoot yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. Have we got anything else? Uh, you sometimes aliens. wear helmets. Okay. There are women in armor. That's good. Oh, That's yeah. Good. yeah. Blonde women in armor. Uh, yeah. yeah. You have weapons and you can turn into balls. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't turn into balls in gears unless somebody blows you apart, but yeah. it's there. Epic. Ep- I don't know. Uh, okay, so Epic's you got- on Gears 5. I know. What the history? So you had to play Gears 5. Yes, the multiplayer. Specifically multiplayer. Uh, I played Escape at E3, which is their new co-op PvE mode. We did a new gameplay today from E3, we showing sure it off. sure did. Uh, and now I went to Atlanta, Georgia. Sunny Atlanta, Georgia. JV is nodding furiously and giving a thumbs up if you can. <laughs> Do you not like Atlanta? I'm from Atlanta before I lived, before I lived here. What? And you don't like it? And you didn't tell this before? <laughs> uh... It's uh, it's hot in Atlanta. It really is. Do you know how many fans we have in Atlanta? We have at least two Nicks in Atlanta that love it. Sorry, Nicks. <laughs> Every Uber driver I had was Nick. That's oh, weird. really? Yeah. There are a lot of Nicks down there. It's a big Nick town. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so you went to Atlanta and you played a new multiplayer mode. Yeah, so I played three different modes while I was down there. Uh, King of the Hill, which is just a mainstay mode from past Gears games. Escalation, which is a mode that debuted in Gears 4. Okay. It's like their eSports mode, like highest level of competition. Uh, There's three hills that pop up on the map, and you just have to basically either wipe the entire team or or dominate all three, and like that's how you win. Okay. Uh, And it's like round over round over round. Uh, and Coalition's proud of that one because they're like, oh, that's our baby. We're definitely bringing that back. Yeah, and okay. they, they've made a lot of changes to it uh, for Gears 5. Like, you know, you used to be able to just one team would place like a weapon on the map and both teams would have access to it. Now each team places it and you have a finite number of respawns. So if you die, you can either be like, oh, we're getting blown out this round anyway, so I'll just not waste my respawns. Or, oh, this is a super close round. I'm going to use one of my five respawns. And I, I think it's like 10 or 14 rounds to best of to win. Or best of 13, I think it is. Sure. Um, so first one to seven there. Um, 
And uh, but arcade, that's the new mode that uh, they have announced. What and does it, that mean? It's like a hero shooter mode. So like every like there were five characters on each side. There's swarm and cogs, and uh, each side has five five different characters you can choose from. They have different abilities. Like Kate is like faster, and I think she has like faster reload times or something like that. Uh, so there's like Kate, JD, Marcus, Dell, and then Foz, who's a new character. Foz. F A H Z. All right. A uh, new character in Gears Five. Um, assuming we'll learn more about him as we learn about the campaign. Mm, Gears Foz. Uh, <laughs> and then you know there's the five different classes on the Swarm side, and they're going to be adding new characters like later on. As a huge Overwatch fan, do you like it when other games go for the hero shooter mold, or is it just like, all right, they're trying to catch the trend from 2016 here? I like the uh, the the different takes on that idea. Like I think that this mode works. Um, it's cool because you can also like. Every time you get a kill or an assist, you earn a skull, and a skull can be used in the middle of like matches to buy upgrades to your weapons. So like I have one thing. If you read our preview that I wrote, uh, GameInformer.com, which is massive and good, it is huge. Wow. It's a, it's one of the longest previews I've ever written for our website. Um, there was a moment where like I was just completely pinned down. There were three enemies like converging on my location. I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to try to take one of them down with me before I die. And I was like, oh, wait, I have like eight skulls saved up because like your skulls carry over from life to life. So I was like, all right, well, let me see if I can buy something real quick. So I just pressed Y, which brings up like this three directional menu and you use the D-pad to just select which one you want. It instantly appears in your hand. You have okay. this awesome weapon. So I did that. Like I pulled out my shotgun. I, I went and I was like, oh, wait, I have skulls. So I chose a rocket launcher and I just blew all three of them to pieces as they were like running up on me. So it, like it has the like the ability to change the complexion of like any situation that you're in. I smell little microtransactions popping mm -hmm. in here. None of it. Oh, no. that's right. At E3, so, Rod Ferguson went out there. That was a big... So, yeah, they're that's another thing they're changing. They're changing their uh, approach to post-release content. So, in Gears 4, they had, like, all the loot boxes and, like, RNG nonsense in it. Plus, uh, plus they gave you the maps for free if you were only using it in matchmaking. If you wanted to use it in your private servers, you had to buy the map. Now, Weird. all the maps are going to be free for, like, both private and public servers, which is great. Uh, and then there's three different ways you can get content, uh, like cosmetic content in the game. So there's uh, just like in-game accomplishments. Like I'm sure, I don't, he didn't give me any examples, but it's going to be like, kill a certain number of something with this. Mm -hmm. uh, so like things like that, and like you'll know exactly what you're getting with that. And then there's another one where it's like every hour or so of gameplay, you get another like randomized reward. That's the only one that's like RNG based. Like you'll know exactly what you're going for when you go for these like in-game achievements. And then there's a store that you can use premium, uh, premium content or uh, premium currency that you buy with real money. But that's only available in like it's items that are only available in the store. So there's like each thing is kind of like exclusive. Like you can either exclusively earn these through gameplay or exclusively buy these. But it's all cosmetic. JV, um, I don't want to single you out and call you out here, but you kind of look like you're falling asleep. And I'm wondering if it's just Gears Five in general, or is it Brian's sweet dulcet tones? What could Brian Chase <laughs> say about Gears Five right now to get you excited about this game? No, no, I wasn't falling asleep. Okay. He's just heard Check all this. The tape, he, he read my article. No. Okay. Um. The problem is, is that there's so much about like gears. What interests me about gears is the single player stuff. Oh, really? Like, okay. Gears multiplayer, when I've played it, has always been at like preview events or whatever, and I liked it when I played it there, but never enough to like, you know, dissuade me from playing Overwatch or Titanfall. I remember when all all of those games came out like within the same year, uh, and I played gears multiplayer maybe. 20 minutes before it was just like I really like Titanfall I'm gonna go back to Titanfall so you know I feel like it's really hard to sort of direct a criticism at Gears right now multiplayer except like there's something that doesn't work there for me you know it's not bad it's just like there's nothing there that like keeps me invested so yeah, the hero yeah. aspect might do that 
might. We'll, we'll see. Uh, it but, seems like their their fan base is passionate. I think it just has a tough time expanding. And it seems like with Gears Four, they win four with the esports, and now with Gears Five, they're pushing it again, really trying to get more people. So in they're the doing store. the esports on one side of the spectrum, and then they're yeah. also doing the arcade, which they've admitted is like fully like we're trying to appeal to the casual audience with this mode. So hopefully that's like successful in there. And they're also changing up a little bit of like how the gunplay works. So uh, they recognize that just shotguns rule their entire competitive suite. They really do. Right. Uh, so they reworked uh, how recoil works on rifles. So it used to just be like as you just bum, 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 the the reticle just blooms to like a wider thing. It just becomes less accurate. Yeah. Now they actually have fixed recoil patterns. So as you're shooting your lancer, it actually like kind of rides up. So, so more you, reliable. So if you try to compensate, you can like learn that that pattern and compensate for it. Okay. And not have to like be like, oh, well, it's just going to get crappier as I fire more. Are you optimistic about Gears 5's multiplayer then? I think so. Yeah, played? I mean, I'm, I'm most excited for Arcade. And they've got, like talked about how like if you're like, I think the quote that I got was something like, I'm going to paraphrase, obviously, but like they look at the, as like a pyramid almost where it's like at the bottom of the pyramid is like arcade and like team deathmatch. And then as it goes higher up the pyramid, like it, it gets to like escalation, which is like the top of the pyramid. This is like once you've like found a group that you like playing with and like you're comfortable with like working with these guys and communicating with these guys uh, and you, you're, you're happy with your skill level, like you think you can compete with like the top tier players, that's when you jump into that mode. They don't want you to jump straight into escalation. Okay, gotcha. Um, and they announced that Horde mode is coming, right? Yes, that is going to be their next beat. Oh, uh, so okay. they, they talked about like at E3... In June, which is E3, they're going to talk about escape mode. July, which is right now, they're doing competitive multiplayer. August is going to be Horde. And uh, September, right before launch, is going to be campaign. That, ooh. What? There's, what, JV? I think it says a lot. Maybe not about the finished project. But it's just, it feels weird to me. It feels weird to me. To that, hold on to campaign for so to, long? To, like, right before launch. Well, like, if it was like, if it was like, oh, here, where it's going to be the last thing we cover, but it's like two months before launch. That's cool, but like right before, they just maybe don't want to spoil things. But remember, like the first trailer from E3 last year, like that was very story Gave a focused. Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. like it was. It was probably like a six-minute video or something. It felt like more than a glimpse. So it's not like they're not t t saying anything. Or, right, right. Yeah. But that was totally story focused in the sense like we didn't really see much like gameplay. Right. You know, Correct. there there have been a fair amount of open or like rumors about changes that gears 5 is making well you know that kate is now the person you yeah. play as which i'm excited which about cool. that yeah sure but like i'm not sure if this is a rumor or fact now but like <laughs> open world i like, haven't heard that yeah oh, okay really? so it's a rumor yeah there have been rumors about it going open which could just be nonsense hmm. yeah. like hogwash or whatever but i kind of want to see what an open world gears is like and maybe that's why they're holding on to because they want to have that last big marketing beat of like and guess what open world because ah like, that was the case i think i'd want a better way to get around like running through a map is not my favorite thing in Gears yeah. of War. Well, you get a canoe, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or you can spider swing now. Yeah. Mm, everything you need. But this will be the first Gears game that launches like on Game Pass. I wonder how that's going to yeah. affect like the multiplayer crowd. If it's like, well, Xbox pushes it hard as their big flagship multiplayer experience for the fall. Like I, that could have a decent chunk of an audience there. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that Game Pass people also get it early. Like if you have the ultimate Game Pass, like you get it with like the ultimate edition owners because Microsoft always does that where if you buy the ultimate edition, you get it like the Friday before the Tuesday launch. That's very confusing. Uh, Shay, anything else you want to plug on the site? Anything that's cool this week? No. Okay. Cool. Do you want to go on a trip sometime soon? Sure. Okay, great. Let's never reveal details beyond that. Where are you uh, guys going? Oh, oh yeah. We'll tell you right after you actually clap out, if that's okay. All right. Oh, okay. my hand's stuck. Benjamin Reeves. Hello. Welcome. And we have Dan Tech. Hello. Dan Tech, uh, you're going to be traveling in the near future? Yes. Cool. Can you say where that is, too? No. Great. Uh, <laughs> what kind of questions are these? <laughs> it's important. If you listen to the show... <laughs> all right. Uh, Leo Vader. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, you've been playing a game called Grifflands? We all have. Oh, really? I was expecting just to talk to you, but I guess these, Sorry. these problems are in the way. So, Grifflands, this is a new RPG from Clay, mm -hmm. the Don't Starve studio. Yeah. Well, it's a like card game. Right, right. Card game RPG type thing. Is it not an RPG? Uh, I guess it's I definitely an RPG. It 
Yeah, it doesn't feel super RPG to me. Really? Like in the traditional sense. Or in the way like, that you're building relationships with characters, then you're like upgrading stats or anything. Yeah. But you, you do upgrades. I mean... How would you define this thing, Tack? I would it's, say it's a card-based RPG. Much it feels the, like a roguelike deck builder more than I would say RPG. It is part of a, of a very big generation of card-based CCGs, roguelikes, that are sort of rooted in Slay the Spire's popularity. Sort of, we saw a huge uptick of them, and there's... So hang on, real quick. Was Slay the Spire in early access long enough where you believe that Clay saw it, played it, and said, let's make... I can't make that assumption about a developer. That's... But and... Grifflands did used to be something completely different before oh, they really? restructured what the game was about. What was it back then? It was going to be more of a full-fledged... RPG, right? It was, it was, people it was always announced as a turn-based RPG, but we didn't know any specifics. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, and mm. now it's in alpha on the Epic Game Store, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you guys heard of this? This Epic Game Store? I've been on Here, there a few a times. big deal. Yeah. What do you think of that, Doug? I got games. What do I think about it? Are you annoyed every time you have to use the Epic Game Store? I, I don't like using more than one. I have like, you know... Uh, as far, okay, so we're just discussing the launcher component here. No other aspect of it today. Uh, Careful. Yes. Uh, Easy. So I already have a bunch, so it doesn't really bother me. Like, I've already had the Blizzard launcher, the Riot launcher. Uh, there's tons of launchers on my PC. It yeah. is perhaps slightly annoying to add another to the docket, but mm -hmm. that's, so that's all. But well, what about, like, cloud saves? There are no cloud saves on the store as of right now, I believe. Right, doesn't and that make you angry? Does it make me angry? Yeah. No. Then why are you getting red and twitching? I'm getting really upset about oh that. Wow. God. No cloud saves. Urgh. Well, it was annoying for us because we wanted to record that new gameplay today video for Grifflands, which we put up, and it was like, oh, how do we do this without cloud saves? This sure. is a slight hassle. I think it should. I, I would like cloud saves there, but it doesn't make me angry. Okay. That they don't All right. exist. Relax, All right, dude. Just calm down. You seem down. a little. Nice. <sighs> okay, Grifflands. Uh, Reeves, what do you think of this thing so far? I like it a lot. I really like Slay the Spire, so another game like that's okay with me. But this one's cool because it adds more, kind of like Leo was saying, a little bit more like dialogue options. Like you're conversing with characters a little bit more. There seems like there's more to the world. You're exploring the world a little bit more, which I like a lot. Okay. So it's conversations in between. Then it's like, all right, now let's battle. Yu-Gi-Oh style. And then they whip out some cards at this tavern. Is that what's going on here? <laughs> so, so to set the table a little bit I wish I know we've dropped the Slay the Spire title already a couple times and people are going to be like oh don't compare it to that but the <laughs> the, the, uh, the, 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 the factor you know talk about it on its own merits don't talk compare it to I something else that. and there is a lot of Slay the Spire DNA in this game like a lot like, it's like they saw it and they were like yoink <laughs> No, I, is I, that I, what you're saying? I definitely That's am not saying I'm that. I'm saying like they're building upon that that template of the card-based RPG that many developers are embracing now, mm -hmm. uh, especially on Steam. So and you're saying more than Clay is ripped off Slay the Spire? I certainly never said that. Okay, that's what I heard. Okay, well, you but need yeah, to check it, your hearing. It's very similar, but different is what you're saying. Yeah. When are you two going to go on the road? <laughs> Hopefully no time soon. One is... thing we should add is that I really hate Dan. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. Get it on. At least it's on the open. One thing we haven't talked about is like... Hang uh, on. I think you should apologize. Oh, Say Dan. Not, hey, I'm sorry. I, cool. I, you know I don't hate you. Okay. <laughs> Dan, I don't you know do if you know believe that, it, right? but... I, I, totally, I totally know that. Okay. So we're just layering on things here. That's, okay. Tag, if you... If you... Like, the correct answer to this would win you $1 million. Ooh. And it would be scientifically proven. Mm. If you had to check a yes or no, and it says, does Ben Reeves like you, what would you choose? I'd say yes. Okay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> See? See? You're Perfect. bonding already. <laughs> Have you guys met? It feels like we're really close now. <laughs> Have you met my brother, Dan? We Tech? do talk about games on this podcast yeah. at some point, right? <laughs> Every once in a while. What were you saying about Grifflands? Well, what I was going to say is, like, actually, there's, like, a there's like almost two... Uh, battling components because like one you're actually battling physically with I mean with the cards but like you're actually like attacking other characters and the other one is like a dialogue combat where you're like what? arguing your case with other people they're two separate decks and two separate HP pools essentially for oh. these different kinds of encounters and yeah. so one of the decks just has like verbs and insults and stuff on it? Or yeah, sort about? of, yeah. Diplomacy and hostility, they're called. It's like nice things to say or mean things to say. That's a really fun idea. I think it is such an interesting component of this game, the way they gamify negotiation. Because it'll be all these different opportunities, like you're just going to negotiate for more money at the start of a yeah. mission, or you want to convince this guy to leave your friend alone who he's about to kill. And instead of fighting, you can just choose to convince him. And it's you're seeing arguments floated that are doing damage to your arguments, and you're Ooh. trying to like... 
it's just such a such a fascinating way of yeah. gamifying something that's normally just attributed to a stat yeah. called speech. You know, and it's cool because there's fewer stakes there. Like you're you can definitely lose one of those battles, but then you don't lose the game. Like things just go on, but you don't like say you lose like oh this guy doesn't join my party or oh I'm not going to get that like extra money that I was arguing for. But yeah, but it's still fun. Tack as a as a man who hates story but loves some mm. some visceral gameplay and and, and I systems. I don't hate story. I know, I know, I like the tease. <laughs> but when yeah. you say that, you know, people are gonna people are gonna <laughs> run with it. I understand that, but I feel like we've had dozens of conversations on this podcast. You're like, ah, the story. Blah, 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 yeah. blah. But six months from now, I'll be reviewing something and then I'll be like, oh, Tack hates story. And just, <laughs> All well, right, you well, gave everything that's what a he chance. Said. There we go. You like the what was that one game that came out earlier this year? Endless Sea. Uh, uh, sunless, uh, sunless skies. Sunless skies. Well, close enough. <laughs> sunless Sea was the previous title. Oh, okay. All right, that's not too outlandish. Then. Is that still the best story in games? I think it's one of the best. That's amazing. Wow. But to this point, how are the systems of Grifflands? So yeah, so we've already talked at length about the core systems, but yes, the relationship building aspect of it. It's not story like this. Isn't you're not. There is a story, yes, but it's all really rooted in the systems and functions, including in the relationships. It has like a sort of a, not, this isn't, you know, compl- I just want to give them uh, something that people can, can understand easily. So the persona system, yeah. building a relationship with people. If you get friends with somebody and then you're like, you're in a bar fight, if they happen to be in the bar, they'll help you out. Oh, that's so, cool. And you get, you get rewards for, for making friends and not making enemies. In fact, you have the option during fights to either to kill or let them surrender to opponents, and that can be that can have uh, reverberations yeah. no. down you, the line. Are you killing a lot of people? I find the killing the killing run, I believe, is very difficult right <laughs> now. You lose you lose HP for every person you kill, and it makes you much harder to get assistance to help you fight bosses. Wait, yeah. why do you lose HP? That's one of the that's okay. one of the mechanical structures in place. I've that, just been uh, like letting everybody go. So yeah, you oh, should. Well, I mean, it seems like the way to you go. should. You don't have to, but you're incentivized. However, there are like. I'm working on building out that uh, that deck and those uh, artifacts. They're called graphs, but they're like basically permanent passive yeah. buffs. There is a, there is a structure in place to to facilitate the kill run. Like there's a special graph that makes it so enemies won't surrender anymore. Hmm. But you get another action point per turn. Okay. When I will is your say... rap album Kill Run coming out? <laughs> ah, next week. Great. I will say the systems are really smoothly implemented in a lot of these procedurally generated or roguelike type games. You worry about seeing the seeing behind the the veil right you know to just the the core building blocks that are in it but yeah my first run i forgot it was even a roguelike the way the quests pop up in the open world and you travel oh, to nice. them get interrupted on your way it all feels very it always feels like almost orchestrated i will say that compared to other current uh card-based rpgs there is that there is a quest structure that feels like you're going through a story at the same time it's not like you know it's not high level or anything but it's like it's there you can like pick to side with like you know the tax the the tax collectors or the thieves in Act Two, and based on your decisions, you'll get special cards that are unique to that faction. Yeah, there's 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 faction siding and stuff like that. Once you play through a couple times, you do get the sense that like you know, okay, it's all sort of like you know hidden, but it's all you know it's A to B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or A to C, or you know. So it's in alpha. Does it feel ready to go? Should people wait for this uh, bun to come out of the oven a little bit later? It does feel like what is there is complete. However, there are only four of the six days and one of the characters. There's going to be three different characters you can play as and a six-day structure. The days are basically acts, each culminating in a big boss fight. So, But what is there? It's got that thing where it's like, this is early access, but what is there is complete. Yeah. Okay. But not everything Have is there. Have you seen anything like later on where you can like skip directly to like day four, let's say, no. after you've played a couple times? No, That's kind of what I want. I'm sort of, and after you do complete it, uh, it does let you sort of uh, continue on by doing, prog- every time you beat it on a higher difficulty, you unlock a new higher difficulty. So you can prestige up and you unlock character outfits and other things like that mm-hmm. to, to keep you going. Right on. Uh, Griftlands, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Griftlands. All right. Check it out if you like that type of game. It's not sure. a grift. Hey. Hey. Hey, Nor Leo in the booth. Hey. Uh, you insisted you would not let this podcast go on Begged. without you talking about Nowhere Profit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We did new gameplay today on it a long time ago, and now it's actually coming out this okay. Friday. What is, is this? It is another deck builder ah, roguelike. Okay. Sorry. But uh, the, the hook is that every card in your main deck is a character. A beast or a person or a cyborg and they have a name and they'll pop up in dynamic story sequences and if they die in combat or in those story sequences they're gone from your deck forever who is this from uh this is oh boy you called my bluff yeah sorry to put <laughs> i don't you know spot. anything about you this. can make it up i wouldn't know oh uh, yeah it's uh, called leo's Nintendo. kind of a oh. cool dude gaming 
<laughs> I like that. I like have you that played studio. this thing, Dan? I, I have not, but you know, I heard good things from Leo, and I have heard uh, murmurings on the internet. It was we had uh, some kind of private beta we had access to, but somebody else was covering it, so I haven't touched it yet. But I okay. am looking forward to diving into it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it PC only? Do we know? Oh uh, yeah, at the moment. Okay. It's, so, it's something something that's weird to say about it. It's probably the longest runs of any roguelike I've played. Okay. You can easily get to three and a half, four hours if you make it near the end. That's wow. long. But it's really satisfying to complete a campaign. There are really good rewards between campaigns, and it's just there's a very natural story that plays out through the random events you'll run into and the different encounters you have. So does it have um, permanent progression or anything like that? Yeah, it's horizontal, same horizontal. as Griftlands, okay. where you're getting new card options. And mm-hmm. Do you like it more than Griftlands? Little bonuses. Oh uh, yes. Really? I do personally. Mm, I gotta right. sign me up. So bullet points for uh, what separates it from the pack are just uh, like the specific character cards? And it, yeah, and just it feels very party based, you know? If you like just building a convoy, of course you've got the classic card game synergies and everything, but I think what's really special about it is naming cards after your friends and then having to make really tough moral decisions with them. Yeah. The remember, old, the old XCOM. Yeah, dilemma. remember XCOM, Reeves? <laughs> I do. Remember when that game isn't on Switch yet? Uh, oh, the original one? Yeah. Even? Isn't that or insane? the original of Fraxis well, one? Enemy Unknown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they should do that. That's very frustrating. Chris Lance kn- has some of that random chance, like XCOM, you know, where you're putting out, it could be one or th- two or three damage. Oh, okay. Hmm. There we go. Uh, that's Griff Lands at Nowhere Profit. Run, don't walk to the card store and uh, <laughs> dish some cards. Is, is XCOM a roguelike? No. No? Why would you say that? I don't know. There's random elements. You die. You can do permadeath. I don't know. I guess. Yeah. But it's, it's, if the uh, permadeath is there. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess so. But You're I mean, not how many runs unlocked. did you just end before you finish it? I mean, I died a lot because I'm very bad at it. But uh-huh. I don't know if I would consider it that. But if you do like the Iron Man challenge where you it's die one death and, and, and your yeah. campaign is done. So right, huh. right. It, it would count that way. Dan, yeah, the I verdicts think, in. I believe so. It has. It's random. Random procedurally generated. Right. Uh, for the encounters? Yeah. For the encounters, yep. yeah. Right? Yeah. Permadeath? Checks the list. These are, these are the two key points, is the randomized, uh, procedurally generated encounters, and then yeah. permadeath. Oh. Those, are, those are two of the key three. I'm forgetting the third. Hell yeah. Oh. Very exciting. Congrats, for Axis. <laughs> we really did yeah. it today. Okay, this has been a hoot, y'all, but yeah. do you guys want to clap out of here? Yeah. Okay. Hey, we got Kyle Hilliard. Hi. And we got Matt Miller. Hi. The Lord has returned. That's what they say mm-hmm. every time so, I come in a room. Is that like a Phil Lord, Chris Miller joke? Do you want it to be? Does that make it more clever? <laughs> I don't even know where it comes from. Like, I think you've said that before. Well, Lord, very, Lord, well Lord and Miller is like a known That's probably why it's in my directors. brain, but I, I want to convey it because you're always so regal and well-spoken. Regal? And, and eloquent. <laughs> yeah, regal is the number one. Uh, you're wearing a crown, like literally. <laughs> yes. I don't know why you're surprised I by that. And you're forcing my lips lot. onto your ring, which I don't <laughs> appreciate oh, at He's all. stealing them like Robin Hood. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, we're talking about Sky. Yeah. Do you guys have a similar read on this? This is the next game from that game company. Okay. Their next game after Journey. Yeah. I feel like it has been a long time of hearing about this. I was excited a long time ago. And then for the last year, year and a half, I've just kind of been confused about what is this? When is this coming out? Do you guys feel like you've had a good sense in the ramp up to the release of Sky? Of of what it is? Of what's going on with Sky? No. no. Okay. Uh, No. Okay, great. I mean, that was the Apple Apple stage presentation, and I feel like it's been pretty quiet, but every now and then it'll be like, hey, there's kind of a beta, but not really a beta. So, Miller, uh, it is out now? Uh, yeah, out on the 18th. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. And so just on iOS? Yes, to start. Although I think that they've, they've implied anyway, without any specifics, that Android's coming very soon and that other platforms are after that including like consoles and stuff like that how I, long yeah. that might be no idea it definitely seems like a game that could work well on consoles i played about yeah. 30 to 40 minutes last night and i spent most of the time thinking man i wish this was on a console yeah you know there's a uh i would say Genova chen is one of the most deliberate creators working in games he has a yes. very clear idea of what he wants to do i believe you're going to be uh, I hope so, yeah. Speaking with the man, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, back half of the show. Uh, and so I, I, I think one of the things that came across for him in this, in this uh, game that he wanted to do was to make it as accessible as possible. And in his mind, that wasn't just about how it plays, 
but where it plays. Totally. And so the choice of going on iOS and very soon afterwards on Android was very much driven for that team by this is the the way by which you could reach people who aren't just traditional gamers. I get it. Um, I'm interested to hear his thoughts on that because I think a lot of developers have tried to tackle that mobile challenge and mm-hmm. I don't know if any have really tackled it well. Like it's the type of game that starts with the notification of like, seriously, use headphones. It'll be, what is it? <laughs> oh, uh, it'll be like a much better experience. Yeah, they say something headphones. like more than 50% of the experience is about the sound. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. It also, it also says if you're not hearing sound, please, for the love of God, <laughs> turn up the volume. <laughs> if, anytime you, you mess with the volume controls, the game assumes it's because you're having trouble hearing something and it gives you another alert about it. Oh, I didn't there, do that. It's like, Maybe you want to plug in headphones, or have you accidentally put mute mode on? Don't do that. <laughs> That's hilarious. So what is this game, and what do you think of it? Uh, I think that it's uh, it's more of a sequel to Journey than I thought it was going to be. 100%. It's n- not like the same universe or, or characters or anything well, like that. Well, you can't that. say it's not. I mean, who knows? Uh, uh, who knows? Maybe <laughs> this is a grand... Marvel Cinematic Universe style the interconnected. JCU. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the Genova the, the Cinematic, Genova cinematic uh, Universe. I was like a journey, but I like Genova oh. better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it has a lot of, like, like people who like Journey, just go get this game. Let's just do that. I mean, right. it's, it's, uh, it's different and, um, than that. It's more socially oriented, but it is a natural evolution of what they did with Journey. Um, and like that game, it is very interested in ideas and, and the experience of, of what it is like to be in a particular gameplay moment. Um, but it also just practically has a lot of functionality that feels like it's, it's directly drawn from Journey and visuals. Even right? like in the beginning of the game, you like slide down the little sand hill a little bit. It's like, yeah. oh my gosh. It's like, oh, then the jump, then the fly. Okay, this is, it's, I was shocked by that too. Yeah. I guess I didn't have that in mind that it's going to be so close. It is. And I, I mean, if in some ways it feels like it's a, uh, a natural follow through in the final moments of Journey. Yeah. I, a lot of people. Journey uh, spoiler. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> if you haven't played Journey by now, you need to go do that. But uh, suffice to say, the end of that game includes a uh, what is referred to in the soundtrack as the uh, the apotheosis moment, I believe. Right, like this mm-hmm. idea of like uh, where things are um, you, you transcendent. You sort of transcendent, right? That's a great word for for that situation. And you take flight. Um, and this game is like, okay, now you're just always going to be potentially taking flight. Constant um, apotheosis, baby. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's that dynamic going on. Um, but on top of it, they've layered in a lot of modern dynamics about social interaction and uh, almost MMO-esque um, grouping up and that kind of thing. But instead of the traditional goals of that sort of thing... There's an almost explicit focus on altruism and compassion okay. as being a way that they're trying to like get people to play with each other. A lot of concepts here. Yep. Are you enjoying your time with it so far? I am. I, I think it's, it's a strange game, and it's yes. not as sim- simple as I thought it was going to be. Um, you, you dive into it, and especially if you're used to this, this team's games, Flower and Journey are you know, about as, as simple as can be. Um, and there's a lot of things about this game that purport to be that at first, but then there's all these weird concepts about like the, the, um, the, what are effectively emotes that you're gathering. Well, let me, and... here's some words that are in the start of the game <laughs> okay. because I had that experience as well where like, it felt like I, as much as I love journey, I feel like those, those moments, especially when I first started playing it where it's like, just trying to understand the scarf and the flying or like mechanically, I don't know if I'm quite, I want this beautiful artistic experience, but yeah. mechanically I'm a little bit confused about what's happening here a couple times. This feels like an extension and kind of like an explosion of some of those feelings. So it's like you start playing Sky and it's like, hey, your expression level is level one. Yeah. Okay. Then you try and go someplace. Only available in Prairie Expression. All right. I don't know what that means. Uh, collect light to earn candles, which can be used to build friendships and buy items. Okay. Tap icon to forge a light tribute. Like all of these things, like, I don't know what you want from me. I'm trying to have this artistic, beautiful experience. What's happening yeah. here? And I mean... For me, like a lot of those things that you're talking about in terms of like what they want you to feel while you're playing that game, a lot of that is hindered to me by not knowing what I'm doing and they're just being a currency. 
Like yeah. that on its own is enough to be like, well, I'm managing some kind of stat here yeah. that immediately like it sort of, it hinders me getting to feel like, oh, I'm part of something. I'm flying through the air. Right. When it's like, well, I have four candles. Do I need to buy more candles? Like it really, it hurts it. I, I think that is absolutely fair. Yeah. It's, it's something that I've struggled with. I, I think it's fair to guess that I'm I'm several hours further in than you guys yeah, probably are. Like two hours. Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah. I, and I at this point, I think I probably put in, I don't know, twelve to fifteen hours into the game, um, and wow. and thus at that point, kind of played through all the content and returned to the content, uh, like individual levels yeah. and found and would, new and things. And would have a better understanding of like what you're unlocking. I I know. think I I think my biggest recommendation for people to get the most out of this game is to kind of not worry about it, the, the, which is... <laughs> yeah, Kyle. Uh, well, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, because I did. I yeah, did yeah. what you're doing, Kyle. And there's a temptation to treat this game, because it's a game, like all the other games you've played. And so when it presents something like currency... How could I? No, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, uh, it sounds like a stupid thing to have to say. Uh, like, don't worry about all that stuff. Yeah. But... I re I, I'm really serious there that like I think the game is better if you divorce yourself from expectations that you bring to the game because you've played other games. Yeah, which is something uh, I was able to do with Journey. I feel like you know, yep. and just sort of like dig into what the uh, visuals on screen and let them sort of wash over me. Yeah. You know? Well, that's fine. I'm ready to have the artistic experience. It yep. seems like you're pitching here, Miller, but I'm running those same problems where it's mm -hmm. like I I don't know what this is and I'm confused and I feel like I'm missing out or I'm dumb. And I have a piano on my back. And, and that, that's, that's exactly what I'm, I, I'm saying, is that all that stuff that you're worrying about... Now, I'm not defending that the game has that stuff or that it, it maybe they haven't done a good enough job of, of, of like keeping that away from your, your artsy fun. Mm -hmm. That maybe is a problem with the game. But I'm saying you're, you're going to have more fun if you just ignore all that and you just go flying, hmm. right? Like, if you just go into these levels and you're like, that looks pretty... I want to go see what that's about. I just met this person and they did a little flip for me and it says that I can give them something. Maybe I'll do that and see what happens. That's the game. That a, a lot of the game is that, but there is more of the game that waits after that. And that over time by doing that sort of natural flow of play that you're going that you could be enjoying and just kind of like, "Oh, look at these clouds. That's so cool looking." And Oh, it looks like I fell it through a hole. It is a very pretty game. Like, it's to really yeah, pretty. For and, sure. and musically... Yeah. The, well, I the wasn't... I muted it, so... I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just I'm just kidding. No, the music's great. The, the I music, put AirPods in, the, like, immediately. The oh, sound yeah. effects, the the visuals, just the, the broader aesthetic of the game is all just really kind of breathtaking, especially mm -hmm. for a mobile game, um, just comparing it against other things that are on, on the iOS platform. Um a lot of that other stuff about the currency, about the replay value, about the places to go into levels that you feel like, oh, I think I should be able to get up there. How do I mm -hmm. get up there? All that stuff is you can come back to, and you should come back to, to, to get the most out of the game. And instead, yeah. you should just kind of play it through, do what feels like the, the game sort of, um, there's almost a natural like river flow to the game. There's times that literally the wind is blowing this way, and you your temptation as like a hardcore gamer is like yeah but but there's a tunnel over there uh -huh. if i walk against the wind for 10 minutes i bet i could get there <laughs> and that's like don't do it man i know that's what you've trained yourself to do but i i think it's wrong in this case that initially the game wants you to go and go with the flow and then later when you have more energy and you have mm. a bigger wing, mm -hmm. right? The wing is like the thing that lets you fly higher and stuff like that. Then some of those places are much more accessible and okay. more fun to go discover. This feels like, again, just half an hour in or so, 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 you know, grain of salt, but it feels like it could be one of the most challenging games of the year to, for the industry to wrap its mind around how should we feel about Sky? Um... I wouldn't hazard to tell anybody how they should feel about it. <laughs> but Isn't that I, the point of this podcast? Uh, but I would say that um, it is a game that deserves a a long and deep look, um, not one that, in all defense to your half an hour, that that half an hour is going to tell you much. Oh yeah, right? yeah. Like it's a. I think in my first half an hour or hour, I had one understanding of the game. And where I'm at like 12 hours in, I'm still sort of like, oh, that's, 
I didn't realize that about how this game works, right? Um, I think it can be a really fun experience for somebody who wants to just kind of have this casual, beautiful, artistic thing to play through. You can you can go with the flow of the river through the game, mm -hmm. right? And and fly around and see some um, some neat stuff. And be nice to people. And then be done. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there is a game that opens up beyond that that is. Um, that encourages longer term investment and returning to places. And in a way that like, there might be a level that you've gone through that there's at least as much content to that level that like you've already seen this one stretch and the one way to get through the level. And there's something else that opens up like one path. That's a whole nother level that size, right? That you can uncover. And so that's a lot of a lot of that long term investment I think comes from that, um, and on top of it you have this element of like meeting people, and so you can play with real friends, right? Um, which journey you couldn't do, right? Yeah. You can actually like the three of us can meet up and we can play in the game. We can hold hands and we can give each other hugs and <laughs> we can give each other high fives. The most common expression in the game, by the way, in the beta players, is hugging each other. It's very sweet. It is, right? Like when you see each other, people just come and hug each other. And that's kind of what happens in the game. There's a functionality where like you go through and you gather all this light. And that's like a currency for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you just give it away rather than spend it on like new stuff for your character. And then people give you the light that they've gathered. And that's all right. meant to be kind of I see the part magic of here. how okay. the game is meant to be building up. So... I don't know. I I, <laughs> I I think it's a, it's a really interesting project. Yeah. Um, it's not it, as much as it is uh, familiar to people who like Journey. It's doing several new things. It's a much bigger game than Journey was. Um, I. It's a thinker. It's a thinker. Uh, and do you know how much it costs on iOS? I don't. One of the reasons we've decided to um, uh, hold off as of this recording. Uh, is because there's a lot of details around the monetization that by the time you're listening to this are going to be clearly apparent. Okay. And we don't know that information yet, and so we're we're holding off right now. So. Gotcha. Uh, hey, that's that's Sky yeah. on iOS, everybody. Check it out. I think so. All I right. I think it's interesting. Uh, Kyle, anything else you want to convey? Um, I worry that when it comes to other platforms, it'll be written off as, oh, that was that mobile game. I think you're right. And I don't love the platform. I don't uh, like having my thumbs come oh, out I don't, that beautiful. Yeah, imagery. you know, I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually my my one big gripe with the game is that with its focus on accessibility, the the twin thumbstick things yeah. handling both ground movement and flight, that's a real tall order. I don't think I've ever played a game that has gotten it completely down, and I'm afraid this is not the game that does it. Yeah. There's still times you're going to feel like you're wrestling against the controls um all due respect to the idea of like them reaching out to an audience that they might not normally reach by being on phone i think it would be i would be having more fun with real twin sticks underneath my thumbs yeah miller it's almost as if there's a lot to unpack here and that we should have a whole interview with Genova <laughs> chan in the back half of this episode maybe oh, that's that'd smart. be a that's good smart. idea you know what you should do is like reach out to them that's it it's gonna happen <laughs> we're gonna line this sucker up right now uh okay do you guys want to Actually, huh? no, no clapping out. No clapping. Let's move on to emails right now. All right. Oh. And welcome back to the Gameformer Show. We have some wonderful emails that people sent into podcast at Gameformer.com. And to help us sort through them all, I have the one, the only... Jeff Clark! Hey, buddy. Welcome. Oh, it's so good to hear your voice. It's so good to be projecting it. Uh -huh. And then Ben Reeves. <laughs> Hello. Oh, great. Also Sir, my voice. Zero Vasquez. This, this is my voice. Zero. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> It'll do. <laughs> Who has the best voice in the office? Serial. Well, you... Was that your answer? Or is it... Are you no. saying who has oh, the best that is voice definitely in the office? Not my answer. Question mark? <laughs> That's uh, the question cereal? mark. Yes. Hmm. Kind of like Fava's. Maybe what? more. What? Fava's? What? Like, what are you talking about? I don't know. That's offensive. <laughs> How oh, dare you, oh, sir? Oh, were these on? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, oh, sorry. I mean, we can start, wow. we can start yeah. the podcast now. Honestly, you know who maybe has like the most distinct voice? Man, I think I Leo's so. voice. Well, yeah, of course. But I think Leo has a very distinct voice. Yeah. Don't you think so, Leo? Thank you. Do people say kind, kind things about your voice? or They have. 
Did I've it always mean felt things? like it was too high pitched, but that's probably how everyone feels. Well, I just don't know what that'd be like. Like my voice, I feel like is all over the place. Maybe slightly higher, but what does it feel like to open your mouth and have a higher pitch thing come out of it? <laughs> it hurts my ears. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Dan Tack's voice is pretty good. I do think he has a good voice. Yeah, yeah. He sounds I'm like not that, just saying uh, that. Turn Brian points. <laughs> Why do I feel uncomfortable when you even bring up Dan's name, Reeves? <laughs> Podcast at GameInformer.com, everybody. People sent in email, emails, uh, no matter what I say. Uh, their questions, mm-hmm. feedback, words mm-hmm. of wisdom, dares, trivia, little games, anything that makes the show better, send it into podcast at GameInformer.com. We're going to read through some of our favorites, then choose our absolute number one favorite, and honor where that person is from by putting a pin in the big board. The big board. The big board covering all of planet Earth. Look at all the cities doubling up. They're in the <clears throat> Pacific Northwest. Yeah, except your, for your bias Earth. is showing. <laughs> Look, it's them. They have great questions up Has there. Has anybody mm-hmm. ever sent us a riddle? Yes. Yes. Um, God, what was that? They have. Hmm. Please read into podcast again for if you can remember that riddle that somebody sent Has you. Has anyone ever sent a, a fully customized crossword puzzle that features all of our names? No, but that's tough to convey, I feel like, for the audio mm-hmm. listeners. So I don't think we want We won't that. know until we try. Yeah. People sent in a lot of fun merch ideas. Oh, cool. Including some fun gang charge ideas, Reeves, but I'll mm. let you <laughs> go make those on Cafe Press. <laughs> I just forwarded those immediately. What's the most popular like theme? Is it a lot of like best art stuff or There's some best art stuff? More like clapping stuff than I expected. Mm. But like, what do you, what do you mean by clapping stuff? It says just like clap out and stuff. People want on a t-shirt. Yeah, I guess that oh. kind of makes sense. That fits the show. <laughs> that is the show, I guess. We do clap several times an episode. Uh, so thank you for sending those in. Uh, it's in a pipeline. I don't know what's on the other end of that pipe or what obstacles are also <laughs> in that pipe. <laughs> just threw something down of... something and we'll find out where it goes. Well, we're smoking that pipe. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh-huh. Do you have a joke, Cork, that was nah, That's not worth it now. <laughs> okay, great. First email is Jermaine from Chicago. Hey, with the release of Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 coming up and me being more partial to DC than Marvel, uh, plus DC has better villains, more kind of characters, my question well. is, oh, would you guys like to see an Ultimate Alliance type game within the DC universe that was next gen and on all major consoles? What company would be your first choice to make it? I would like to see a good version of Marvel Ultimate <laughs> Alliance 3. Just kidding. I, uh, I just watched it for a little bit, but holy yeah. cow. You're not into it, Kirk? You love that first game so much, but I—that's I, a one and done franchise, I think. And this third one, did you like Marvel Heroes? Did you try playing that at all? I played it for a little while, and yeah. I was. I th- who's the character that everyone started off with as default, like oh, Daredevil or something? Maybe I forget. You got Spider-Man pretty early, I think, too. Yeah, but yeah, I don't remember. I didn't spend enough time with that to really get into it, but it seemed okay. okay. It was okay. Yeah. yeah, it didn't. It didn't have any of the charm of Marvel Ultimate Alliance right. number one. Yeah, but, but hey, this one DC. Mm-hmm. Do yeah. you think that could take off? And who do you want to make it? What, what about Raven? Have them do it. Oh, that'd be interesting. I think that'd be kind of cool, actually. Well, that's confusing because they're obviously owned by Activision, and I'd imagine this would be a Warner Brothers joint. But hey, if you're gonna tap, but somebody, still, you could have those fine folks on the podcast that talked about the development of the original game. Uh, they're all independent now. Oh yeah, just reassemble that team. But you have those layabouts at, at Rocksteady to get off their hind ends and do mm-hmm. something. Yeah, yeah, they're probably still just role-playing Batman scenarios <laughs> in the office over just there. Just thinking Oh, we're working on something, guys. We need to buy all these costumes for nothing. Uh, does it have to be something that's, like, realistically this would happen? Because, like, best case scenario, Blizzard does something like that, right? Right, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, there's the fictional realm, but mm-hmm. just get out of your comic book world, Ben Reeves. This is, this is Earth Prime hey, or whatever. Yeah. How about TT Games? Like a non-Lego version Oh, just interesting. Just straight up, like... What's wrong with the Lego version? I think that'd be super fun, they've too. Done they've I done mean, that. They've done that. I'm sure that they would <laughs> They would love to work within the licensed universe. Yeah. For a change. But they've never a made change. a Lego game that's like a straight up full action RPG. I think that could be interesting if they try and kind of reinvent the boundaries and create a slightly different genre than mm-hmm. just kind of the action platformers that they're making yeah. over and over again. That's good. I was thinking uh, along the same lines, like Warner Brothers Montreal... Get off their heinies. Oh. Quit role-playing as Rocksteady developers <laughs> up there and pretending you don't have anything to work on. Oh, we're working on something. We won't be at E3 this year, <laughs> I swear. Um, but realistically, it would be Turbine, right? Who made Infinite Crisis, the MOBA. Remember like that? if it was going to happen, that yeah. would be the studio. Yeah. Also, I did not realize this. I thought Turbine closed down. Turns out they just got renamed to Warner Brothers Boston. Did you guys remember that? Mm, really? I mm. did not recall. Did not. Have recall. they put out a game since? Oh, oh, yeah. I think some Lord of the Rings thing, some mobile 
Hmm. Is that the card stuff? game? I don't know. Is Let's slot move machine on. Game? Let's move on. Okay. I forget. What? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I was stumped by this name. An email? <laughs> on this piece of paper? Hey, what? Harsha from Rochester, Minnesota. Huh. Harsha, barely knew a... Welcome, Harsha. Thank you for writing in. Uh, I'm yeah. a fellow Minnesotan and an aspiring comic book artist. Please don't make fun of my name. No. And I listen to the, <laughs> and I listen to the podcast while I draw. Uh, I watched the replay of the Superman Returns game and was wondering what comic book characters you're big fans of. What superhero slash villain do you think would enjoy you would enjoy in a third-person action-adventure type video game? The answer is very clear. It's Ant-Man. Oh, oh yeah, that's good cool. okay. Minish Cap 2. Because then you get both <laughs> worlds. That is tough. Big so guy we, in a little world and little guy in a big world. The, t- the two genres. <sighs> yep. Of game. I, could tech handle that? Is there any game that has you do I that I big? don't care. I know, but seriously, is there anything <laughs> that has that big of a shift? Super that's Mario Bros. Bros. I know, but like instantaneous, like popping huge and small. Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> that's <laughs> true, the original Ant-Man. <laughs> hey, you guys uh, really run me through the ringer the other day where I didn't, so. I didn't play a lot of Mario games growing up. And oh, so this. while playing Super Mario Maker 2, like one of the objectives is like finish the game as Super Mario. I had never considered the idea that when it's big Mario, that that is Super yeah. Mario. You're, you're treating little, it like some kind of like, guys, check out this obscure game fact you <laughs> didn't know. I assume other people in the audience are with me and that they had never connected that Short Mario is just called Mario, and then Tall Mario is Super Mario? I'm with you. Thank you, Leo. But Leo also didn't play to... Mario games growing up. But where... I'm going to read through every pamphlet and see if it actually explicitly yeah. says that. The, the first time you get the, the mushroom, Mario says, now I'm Super Mario. Oh. No accent or anything. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's why it's like Super Mario Galaxy and stuff is because he's always big. Like if he was always short in one of those 3D games, it would just be called Mario. It's because they have a brand name to maintain. That's mm. why. That's tricky. Yeah, what did they get bigger in just Mario Brothers? Right? They were oh, all yeah. one they did. Oh oh you mean yeah, original I, Mario no, no, Brothers? No, no, the original Mario Brothers that was one screen. They were all the same size. Yeah. yeah. So there we go. That's when they're original Mario. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's very and then the Super Mario. Did you know this, Reeves? Yeah. Does every I don't know where I learned it, but I knew it that when he's God, You want to know something else? Another Super fun Mario. Nintendo fact? Yeah. Samus yeah. is a girl. Girls, <laughs> girls. Quirk is just sitting there patiently. All right, let's have this bit play out. <laughs> oh, anyway, so I choose Animal Man. Um, I, know, I read that for a while. Animal when, Man. When New Fifty Two came around, I read Swamp Thing and Animal Man uh, because I loved uh, Animorph so much. Mm. And it's like I could go for like an Animal Man game. You read the like the New Fifty Two version? Yeah. Have you read the Grant Morrison stuff? No. That was that's stuff. That's the stuff that everyone points to. Is like, this is why Animal Man is cool. Oh, really? But yeah. it was described, maybe you pitched it to me as like, the new 52 Animal Man is very incredible. It's like him with the family and all that stuff. So I was yeah. intrigued. I didn't like the art in that. Yeah. Not enough animals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What about and you? I'm not an Animorphs fan. <laughs> all right, comic book fan number one. Uh, uh, who's the best character? The best character? For well, the third person Well, game. we've already had him and gotten the game. Spider-Man. Of course. Uh, Batman's also really good. Uh, one we haven't got, there. we've got bad games, but like Thor is really cool. And I think God of War proves that you can have a fun game kind of in that style. <laughs> With Thor in it. Yeah. I mean, do you think Avengers, there's any universe where that'll scratch your Thor itch? Um, Thor? There's probably a universe. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know if it's going to be good. Okay. I think Daredevil is also kind of cool. Like that could be a cool game. And like he has that built in radar sense. Mm-hmm. And like you already see that in a lot of games like Last of Us. Right. It's like, yeah. oh, what's behind this wall? Like. But could he ever get out of that? Wouldn't you just be unable to turn off detective vision? Uh, I think you would fake it. It'd be like the unfinished swan. <laughs> I mm-hmm. think so. They well, probably made some bizarre Ben Affleck Daredevil game for like GameCube or something, right? Yeah, they probably did. Okay. Did you ever play any of those? Uh, no. Okay. Leo in the booth, can you do research on Daredevil video games, please? Sure. Thank you, buddy. He was uh, in that Spider-Man for uh, Dreamcast. N64. Oh, yeah. That's true. And he's in Ultimate Alliance 3. Oh, that's yeah. basically the Daredevil oh, game. Well, about. I rest my case. Mm-hmm. I mean, Just Spider-Man's like Matt already. Murdock. <laughs> Spider-Man's probably <laughs> my favorite hero, and he's already been done, but maybe, probably Miss Marvel is probably up there. Oh, me. interesting. Yeah. It'd be a very similar game, but... Miss Marvel or Captain Marvel? Miss Marvel. The, the current Kamala Khan. Kamala Khan. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Um, let's see. Alan Cooley from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He took the right turn to... I don't know. <laughs> uh, hey, you don't have to make a joke about each one, you know. 
Hang Stick on. with name humor. <laughs> That's always the best. Are you saying I don't have to come up with constant mediocre quips on this podcast? <laughs> no. Yeah. That I didn't know that was optional. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's oh it's God. on the signs that are over there that tell you how to be on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Leo, do you have a Daredevil info fact? The only Daredevil game where he is the titular eponymous character was Daredevil for the Game Boy Advance, based off the 2003 action film. Oh, oh weird. I bet that looks bad. Okay. Let's play a replay. Yeah. Alan Cooley writes in and says, hey, one of the biggest surprises for me at E3 this year was that there was no mention of GTA 6. I know Rockstar typically avoids E3, but it's been almost six years since the release of GTA 5. This got me thinking, is it possible that the game comes out very early after the launch of new-gen consoles? If so, how would this affect the market for next-gen? If consumers are basing their console purchases based on which console will run GTA 6, do you think the company that sells the most consoles will be whomever offers the most... Uh, the the lowest price is basically what he's getting to here. <laughs> oh. Just like the cheapest way to play GTA 6, they mm. will win the console generation. And if you're Wait, going by that logic... All in one game? I mean, it's going to be huge. Well, yeah, but... But he's saying... It's if not going to be the only game that matters. No, but he's saying like if it was right at the launch, right, the uh-huh. PS5 and the next Xbox, and you could spend $100 less and play GTA 6, the oddball here that Alan Cooley should think about is Rockstar signed up with Stadia... So that would be ultimately the cheapest yeah. way to play GTA 6. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there's any world where GTA 6 comes out in the next, like, two years, though. Like, yeah, they just no. released Red Dead. <laughs> like, we're waiting. we got to wait, like, another four years, probably. Yeah, like, realistically. At minimum. So four years, you think 2023 is GTA 6? Maybe. I would say 2024. Hmm. We might, my bold, insane prediction for when GTA 6 comes out. Jeff Cork? Yes? Give your prediction, baby. 2024. 2024. Yeah. There we go. There yeah, I mean, in six no years. For what month? November. Cork? Mm, June. June. All right. May. Are, is any ounce of you looking forward to GTA 6, Cork? What's, what's to look forward to? Just conceptually, the idea of Rockstar doing another GTA? Yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> you like those games a lot. Yeah. There we go. Sam writes in. He says, hello, Ben, Leo. Serial, Kyle, Dan, and Brian. That's my name. We have a very crowded table. Of <laughs> yeah, close enough. They don't have to be here. You can still say That's hello to true. them, I That's guess. True. Right? That's true. This is Sam from Anderson, South Carolina. Do you have a singular trailer for a new game you'll go back and watch to relive the hype? Watching the Starry Night trailer when Microsoft aired it live on TV, which was also huge for the time during a primetime football game, may be the most excited I have ever been. Is that a Halo thing? I don't know what game that is. Leo, can you look up Starry Night Microsoft trailer, please? Thank you, Lord Leo. Um, Do you ever go and rewatch old trailers? Like, I went back, I go back all the time to watch the Mass Effect 2 launch trailer, which is so good, Hmm. but 80% of it, just like Sky, is just from the music because it's that song that, it just feels like a parody at this point because it's also the song that's used in the beginning of Nathan For You. Like that oh, really epic. I think Donald Trump turned it into a campaign video. Remember mm-hmm. they like re-edited yeah. <laughs> Mass Effect 2? Um, also, the original StarCraft 2 reveal, where it's like Tychus suiting up mm-hmm. and being assembled. Oh, that's the best. I just rewatched it this morning after I saw this email. Oh, really? It holds up so well. I'll do that with like movies sometimes, but almost never games. In yeah. fact, sometimes I'll avoid game trailers. I'll do the, like the opposite because it's like, oh, I know I'm going to play this game. I don't want to see anymore. But then even after the fact, you won't go back and watch the trailers? Yeah, I just never think of it. Yeah. I watch uh, Metal Gear trailers every once in a while just Ooh. to see because I feel like those... I, I watched a lot of Metal Gear Solid 4 stuff thinking about like, oh, like trying to piece this stuff together. It's like, oh, no, it was actually like not yeah. super crazy, like, oh, elaborate. It's just like, this is just scenes from the game. It's not like <laughs> a huge like, oh, we're leaving all this mystery for you to solve. It's just like, no, this is like the f- that those trailers, turns out, were mostly from the first act. Oh, it's still yeah. a trailer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, Starry Night, what is that, Leo? Yeah, it's Halo. Okay, cool. Uh, Winston <laughs> McDaniel says, hey, on the latest GI Show podcast, you maybe jokingly asked... <laughs> Where do they film these commercials where they get to play the latest hardware and nothing gets leaked when talking about the Nintendo Switch Lite? Um, he says, hey, a buddy of mine from high school was in the original Switch commercial, and he was a South African-based actor at the time. I'm sure they film everywhere, but wanted to share what I knew about it, which is that apparently they filmed part of that original Switch reveal in South Africa, which is a very funny mm. idea. What part? Is it just because like, it's remote enough from America that... it? would hopefully not get back to us? Is I that what they're saying? I don't know. Maybe there's a big uh, film industry we out gotta there. we got to find mm-hmm. out. we got to write back. Was your friend on the roof? Were oh. they on the airplane? Yeah, we do need to know. Please write into podcast again for Who was the switch, actually? Was he in... Was it that part in Hyrule? Was that mm. South Africa? 
Oh, the one where he... Or is, was it the What's admin? That joke? <laughs> I think I we're done here. <laughs> My joke telling device is moving away. Uh, hey, you babies. That's Eric from Oceanside, California. Hey, that's your name. Yeah, he mm -hmm. said, who's in charge of the Game Informer magazine Instagram? It's awesome. I love the focus on behind the scenes stuff. I've never heard you plug it on the GI show. Yeah, that's a mistake. I'm sorry we haven't. Um, but yeah, we've kind of gotten back into Instagramming from the Game Informer account in a bigger, badder way. And that is... Uh, Brian Shea and uh, Kyle Hilliard uh, kind of take turns. So you decide who did the good ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get some help from uh, production, right? That's true. Yeah, production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Acrobic and those folks also help out with that. Um, usually like GI spies and stuff I'll, I'll send over. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything that looks crummy and has like a lens flare from my cracked camera on my phone, uh, that'd be from me. Mm. Jeff, uh, you ever jump in there, Jeff Cork? Of course not. Okay, cool. I like I like the, what we do with Instagram because yeah. we're actually doing unique content there. Where mm -hmm. it, like Twitter, we're just like tweeting out our stories. Ugh, Ugh come Getting on. the word out about what we do all day. Well, Ugh. I'm not against that. I'm just saying like He's it's not more crafted. Uh huh. But like, I would fun. like to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but more custom stuff is fun. Yeah. Yeah, and especially like when production goes. Uh, Goes in hot and heavy on some of those. Like, hey, it's Valentine's Day, so let's pose these little amiibos in positions. I don't know where that's going, but they really did. They had like little like they matched up like any like couples in gaming history. Yeah, yeah it was cute. Will stop looking at me, Jeff Quirk. Will <laughs> in Cincinnati says, "Hey, I finally bought a Civilization game. I feel so dumb not being able to figure out how to win. What game made you feel like an absolute dumbass?" Bob is you recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, those are brutal. They're so hard. They're... I, I still love it, but because I'm not gonna be angry about not finishing that game, but it is it is a grind, and like it it helps. It's like a good subtle co-op game. I feel like to have s multiple people beating their heads against the wall, but I yeah. still love. Baba. It'd be more fun with other people because you could both be like, "This is stupid. This doesn't <laughs> make any sense. There's no way to solve this." Baba is dumb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, we are. Wait, dumb. we're both stupid. At least, <laughs> then you can commiserate. It's like, well, at least we're both idiots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I tried Napoleon Total War back when that came out, having never played a Total War game before, and I was just, it was like 10 hours of me being completely confused about what was happening. Oh, yeah. Uh, it did not go well. But I keep trying to get into those, but maybe the new one, Three Kingdoms, will actually help because it's apparently simpler than ever, and it has, you know, like hero units. So. Oh, really? All yeah, right. We'll how bad can it be? Yeah, yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, basically every game I've ever played falls into <laughs> this camp. Uh, Nick from Atlanta writes in. He says, hello, show. It's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing this week. Mm -hmm. Way to go. Yeah. Way to go. And that's got me thinking about space and aliens. If aliens were to appear and you could show them one video game to send a message about humanity, what would it be? The aliens might not understand that the humans in video games aren't real and could potentially be tricked or misled. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would go with something like Overcooked. It shows pressure under stress, Ooh. focuses on our ability to work with others, including non-humans. There is the raccoon in a wheelchair. And shows off our addiction to making money. Hell yeah, Nick from Atlanta. And some very nice recipes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's man! Um, Twilight Zone. Anyways, what game would you guys send? Uh, Death Stranding. <laughs> <laughs> really communicates a lot about humanity. Yeah. yeah. Sight unseen. Uh, I know. I feel like Tetris effect because you get like oh, the beauty, mm -hmm. the majesty of our artistic creations, music, while at the same time it's the Cinem greatest puzzle game ever made. Saying. Yeah. There's also just like how to what degree would they understand us from that uh, is, is like oh are these people just made up of blocks is that what they're trying to tell us <laughs> are you they made of particle dolphins yeah honestly it's the beauty of Tetris though is like how mm -hmm. long you hand an alien that controller how long until they understand the game. A million gazillion years. Because knowing they, aliens, no, no, they figure it out. Understand how it works, you know? though. Because my my best case scenario, or most likely case scenario for aliens, is that it's going to be some amorphous blob that's yeah, made half visible. Fog. Yes, made out of fog. That's the best place, best way to put it. They've got sure. no hands. <laughs> yeah. What are they going to do? Well, assuming they have. How stupid of you to assume that they would have hands? <laughs> At least Ridiculous. three hands. Yeah. You hand them Tetris effect. Mm -hmm. It falls to the floor and breaks. <laughs> <laughs> because they're fog. <laughs> Haven't you been to Area 51, you idiot? So then you have to send them Amazon Alexa games because it's the only games they could possibly and interact with. Assuming they could hear. truly bond is yeah. over that Mr. Robot Amazon Alexa game. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, Leo and I could not get our Amazon Alexa piece of crap working. We're trying to play one of those games again a while ago. And we're oh, having really? some technical difficulties. Oh, man. Uh, sorry, Just Echo. Turning the lights on and off. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Uh, Colin Perkins from St. Paul, Minnesota 
Is he like a weather guy or something? Anyways, uh, perk at play. That's what I'm thinking of. Never mind. Let's He's move the on. Sports guy. Yeah. Hey, Game Informers. I'll soon be getting a new phone after three and a half years with my yes. current device, and I'm getting really excited. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> about the new games and/or apps I'll be able to install and enjoy. What was the first game you installed when you got your current phone? What would you recommend I install on my new phone? Oh, uh, I've had my phone for almost two years now. Yeah. The first game I installed on it was Dr. Mario World. Are you serious? Yeah, I just don't play a ton of games on my phone. Neither do I, really. I mean, other than Bejeweled and Tetris, uh, I don't really play much either. And Sky, of course, mm-hmm. so I could prepare for this interview coming up with Genova Chen. But that's the thing. Whenever I think about jumping to Android and getting out of the, like, Apple family, I just keep thinking, like, well, I can't leave all my game purchases behind. But then I think about it. It's like, you can. I can you absolutely know. do yeah. that. Like, there's so many games. How many that do you I go back to? Yeah. I rarely. I will occasionally try and go back to, like, Jetpack Joyride, which was my one true love for a while there, but... Didn't you say it was the best game ever created by humans? No, I said that Triple Town was like seeing the face of God. Oh, <laughs> apologies. I, I was like on a road trip like six months ago and I went back to Triple Town. I like had nothing else to do. I was like, oh, Triple Town. That's still fun. Mm-hmm. It's a good game. Yeah, you should try saying it. Interesting. And did that Triple come Trump. out before... The new Mario? Dr. Mario game? Well, I wasn't counting it because I had it installed on my previous phone. Okay. It'd be the first game he installed Ladies on his new phone. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, do you Where believe... Where was this road trip? Where was it? When? Uh, uh, <laughs> He's sweating profusely. Six months? Because hey. you said you've had this phone for two okay, years now. Okay, let's move on. Ah, uh, my case. R- case. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> my crest are going to be cased. I just couldn't my, handle it. My caps are cased. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're going to gang charge me with logic. <laughs> that. Okay, buddy. Uh, Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon Go. Cool. Uh, Luke Larson. <laughs> <laughs> he says, hey, I just watched Kyle and Jeff's restaurant build off. What kind of crappy content you get? No, he says that, was, <laughs> he says, that was amazing. Absolutely hilarious. Also, Kyle should be ashamed. That was a pitiful attempt, to be honest. <laughs> you, what is this? Uh, <laughs> Dragon Quest Builders 2, you can build things, appropriately enough. And Kyle and I made a, we had a challenge to build the best restaurant in the game. And he went first, and it was just uh, an embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> what was your restaurant like? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> it looked like a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it on Gameformer's YouTube channel if you want to see it's, that. You should really check out Cork's restaurant. It's incredible. Oh, really? really? Okay. Pictures on the menu and stuff. Uh, How long did it take? It took like an hour and a half, maybe. Oh, That's pretty wow. good. What was the review score for that sucker? What'd you land on? I think I gave it a nine. Wow. The game's great. Cool. Great to hear. Chris Peterson says, I'm watching the Toy Story replay episode to distract myself as Hurricane Barry passes over my house. Stay safe. Um, so thanks for the lighthearted episode. No problem. I'm curious, since Hanson said he was getting ready to go see Toy Story 4, how do you think it turned out? Has everybody else seen Toy Story 4? Or yeah, not? I have not. Okay. Oh, uh, oh. No spoilers here. Uh, Kyle didn't want, like, emotional spoilers. You're okay with me talking about my thoughts on the on the film, right, Cork? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't care. What's an emotional spoiler? I know, just saying, like, I cried or I didn't cry. Um, I oh, did okay. not, I did not tear up, which is insane. Isn't that an emotional spoiler? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, that it, I was asking if it's okay. But then you never waited to confirm. Oh, well, no one jumped yeah. in and said it wasn't. <laughs> I didn't cry. I, there were, I, got, I got a little bit choked up like two and a half times. Uh-huh. And it, there's an opening scene without going to the spoilers where I thought they were going to do something and I was ready to effing lose it out of the gate. And it's like, oh, no. Okay. okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I think I know what you're talking That's about. That's my cryptic yeah. uh, review of Toy Story 4. Uh, I, overall, I really liked it. Yeah. There were... I don't know what counts as a spoiler now, but... <laughs> Everything, were, I think. Okay. Uh, there are things about it that surprised me in... <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> uh, uh, that... I, I don't even know how to say it without spoiling. But yeah, yeah it's... Um, I liked it a lot. Wow. Yeah. Put that on a movie poster. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so it, overall, it's like I didn't want it to exist. Toy Story 3 is like one of my favorite finales ever. It's like, just end it. End it there. Please don't make another one. I made another one. Um... And it didn't blow me away. I liked it more than like The Incredibles 2. But then also it's just like, you know, what's the harm? Like Toy Story is one of the most interesting franchises. It'll keep you thinking, at least me thinking for weeks of just like, what was that analogy for? What's the, what are the metaphors they're actually working with here? And like there's not many films where I'm just wrapped up in thinking about the metaphors that they're playing with conceptually, mm. you know? So it's like, why not just keep that rolling? I'm okay with that. Some people said that it like ruined the series for them. Did you feel that way? 
No. Like, it just like, because they had set up, like, the trilogy, the first trilogy, and, like, ended so well, mm-hmm. and then this is, like, kind of ruined. How does that? that ruin that, though? That I, I got over that. Like, it's the classic Star Wars debate. Like, whatever. You're not going to ruin how much I care about Toy Story 3 just by making Toy Story 4. Right. But is it just me? Like, I love behind-the-scenes interviews and just kind of deep dives into creation of, of films overall and, and media, I guess. But... I haven't seen much for Toy Story 4, and I wonder if it's just because, like, it's like, well, John Lasseter was the director for a long time. Also, you know, we had a couple writers, like Rashida Jones, who left halfway through, so, like, the development was such a But this one, he wasn't involved in at all, right? No, that's what I'm saying. For for 4, Lasseter was originally the director. He was originally? Yes. Oh, okay. I and thought then, he wasn't involved at all. Nope, and then Josh Cooley took over. I think he was co-directing it for a while, and then he took over when Lasseter left. Okay. Um, but curious how much he, of his fingerprints, are still on it. Mm, weird way to phrase that, yeah. but I understand what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, also, in that replay episode, I brought up how I always imagined that toy or that Woody's face was made of wood. Like mm-hmm. his head's made of wood. His name is Woody. He yeah. began as like a dummy. Like it's clearly wood. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that the magnifying glass burns him in the first Toy Story makes it look a hell of a lot like wood. Right. And then in Toy Story Four, they they step on his face and he like pops back out and it shows that it's like plastic which really weirded me out, and I brought that up on the replay, and everybody said that I was a maniac and wrong and stupid for thinking Woody was made out of wood. Uh, I asked uh, somebody who worked at Pixar, mm-hmm. and she's like, yeah, I always it makes sense that he'd be made of wood. He was made in the late 50s, but I guess Toy Story 4's creators thought it'd be funnier if he was plastic. So I feel a little vindicated on the comments yeah. based on that replay. Thank you, Jeff. I'm not you. a maniac. For getting my back. Yeah. For the last time, not a <laughs> maniac. Uh, speaking of magnets, uh, never mind. Trent. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of magnets. <laughs> Trent Magnuson, Maniacuson, says, Hey, Ben, it hasn't gone unnoticed that Dan Tack wears a hat on virtually every video he's in these days. Reiner has been the hat guy at GI for as long as I can remember, but I think Tack has done enough lately to warrant the hat guy title as well. Is this a purposeful move on Tack's part? No! <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. It's just him being him, Is baby. this how he walks yeah. around the office? I <laughs> did. I asked Tack... For the hot scoop on why he's wearing hats only in the videos i want to point out and he said quote unquote because it's fun i think he was walking out of his house and a hat fell on his head <laughs> he's like oh <laughs> this is what i'm doing now this is this is a new personality nah, that's rock and roll now. baby jeff cork you have really good teeth i've never noticed that before hmm. show those chompers <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of like the teeth guy at gi aren't you Maybe. <laughs> well, hold on. Do you just wear those for the video? Cereal yeah, has teeth, too. He's been rocking teeth for a long oh, time. I see no evidence of that. Um, Jason from Knoxville has a Whopper. He says, I've been replaying Deus Ex Mankind Divided, and it got me and my friends talking about dialogue options in games. Hmm. I was saying that something about the dialogue in the game was boring me, and I figured out that it's because it previews the exact word-for-word response for each choice before Jensen says it. Mm. So I'm reading the preview and then watching Jensen say exactly what I just read two seconds ago. It got me wondering, when choosing a dialogue response in a game, do you prefer to see exactly what your character is going to say word-for-word, or would you rather see a more vague preview that's just enough to read the tone of what your character is going to say? Well, there's like three options. You have like the word-for-word, you have like the vague thing, and then there's also just like the one or two word like, Angry. Or like yeah. emotional, yeah. Yep, yep. I don't like that one. I no. like the middle of the road. I yes. like the shorter, abbreviated version. Yep. Which still, I understand it's confusing at times because there are the situations where it's like, no, 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 that's not what I wanted to say. Like, yeah. Yeah. some games will really blow that. That's the thing is I wish there was a caveat. Like, I like having that shorter, like, version, and then they can say what the longer version, but sometimes, like, their response is pretty short. Mm-hmm. And, like, why not, if it's that short, just word for word it? So like, sometimes it can be word for word. Yeah, exactly. If it's short enough to be word for word, that's fine. But sometimes you're, like, the answer is, like, I don't want to do that. And then they'll say, like, oh, I'd rather stick my head up a pig's butt. You're uh-huh. suddenly just like, well, that's not the <laughs> direction I thought that was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish the video game character then turned around and said, oh, it's not? I'm sorry. I thought that's what you were going for. Yeah, it's a pig? I had no idea. Yeah, it's a pig. <laughs> Excuse me? That was rude. <laughs> Yeah, you can't you can't win, but I do hate reading that and then having to sit through it again, especially mm-hmm. you're not able to, to skip it because I like my dialogue fast, baby, in these yes. games. In these there games. Um, Justin from Austin, Texas says, you have no idea how excited I am for the surfing mini game in Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, Tokyo 2020. Pure joy. What about you? No, I'm not. Really? Like, how? Uh, they say that if you can't find joy in getting excited about any of these mini games in Mario and Sonic at the Olympic mm-hmm. Games Tokyo 2020, mm-hmm. then you have no soul. 
Was there a demo that was released for this? Uh, it was at E3. E3. They had a pretty big space, actually, at E3, uh-huh. which is wild. Yeah. But here's here's the mini games. You tell me what you're most excited about playing. Okay. okay. Track racing, Mm-mm. soccer, nope. surfing, skateboarding, mm. taekwondo, hurdle racing, wall climbing, boxing, horse racing, javelin throwing, swimming, soccer, fencing, canoe sprint, tennis, artistic gymnastics, Horse riding slash racing. Can you say those again? I Wait, was hoping didn't you would. Did you say horse riding twice? Yes. Yes, oh. it did. He said equestrian. It's a riddle. So horse riding. Maybe equestrian is different from horse racing. I mean, there's like the funny things of these dumb games, right? Where it's like, hey, it's Sonic riding a horse or Wario. Yeah. Like, you know, Wario, Wario like doing some gymnastics. Wall. Yeah, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Maybe wall climbing will be the funniest thing. Like, what is, what's going to be the, the best GIF from Mario and Sonic the Olympic Games Tokyo The gymnastic one, probably, right? It's going to be Wario doing gymnastics. There's already pretty good GIFs of, like, people fighting each other in Taekwondo, though. Oh, really? Like, from E3, yeah. Ooh, oh, I missed those. Are those they in the geese? Yeah. Like, do they have those yeah, little outfits? Yeah. That's cool. The skateboarding game looks not How terrible. Dare you? <laughs> <laughs> those little karate outfits that they've got going. Those cute little outfits. Taekwondo. Do you feel extra connected to this, court because your brother's, like, an Olympic coach? No, because he's uh, Winter Olympics. Oh, so he doesn't even... He's never I had to choose Sonic. a side. No. I understand. Oh That's very complicated. It's not like he doesn't participate in the Winter Games. <laughs> it's so cold out there. Do you watch the Winter Olympics? I watch parts of it. Oh, is okay. he on TV? I, he's, he was briefly on TV. Yeah. Does, does he, he ever was, wave at you and say, hi, Quirk? He does, very slowly. Very intense <laughs> eye contact. And meanwhile, the athletes are like, I need help, coach. Eyes on me. Eyes on me. <laughs> oh, you can see like the, it says like, gold medal. Well, now it's silver. Bronze. <laughs> now, you can watch the ceremony. At least I got the message out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you guys like for email of the week? Hmm. I'm leaning towards the video game superhero character. Yeah, the first one. Second one. I'll have you know. Oh, okay. From who? Um, I'm leaning that way, but that's not yeah, important. I like that one, but I just want you to say that name again. Because uh, there are any other ones that jump out to you guys? Uh, what about the dialogue one? A little breezy, but mm-hmm. yeah, you get it. What was the one about the moon landing? Oh yeah, the moon landing was good. That one oh. is a hoax, actually. Oh, okay. With the moon landing one, I meant to bring it up, but like we just had our intern Blake just wrote huh. a feature on in honor of the moon landing. It's like a bunch of video games that take place on the moon or parts of. That have levels mm-hmm. set on the moon. Spoilers. Yeah. Yeah. Every video game is better when you go to the moon for a certain chunk of it, mm-hmm. but it, but you can't have your entire game take place on the moon, like the game Moon, because that's not a great game. There was a game Moon based on the movie Moon. No. 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 This is why based said, on the on the uh, or, orbital body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was just a coincidence, but it came out the same year as the movie Moon, which is why when Duncan Jones, the director, was on this podcast, I got to ask him if he'd heard of that DS game. He's like, "Yes, I have." Oh, weird. But no, it has no connection. It's a horror <laughs> game, right? I think so. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's that weird... It's like a first-person shooter, I think. Yeah, but it's the weird mm-hmm. world of like 3DS and DS first-person shooters where people were really trying to shove that down their throats for a little while. Mm-hmm. Couldn't, couldn't walk down the sidewalk without a first-person shooter <laughs> on the DS so and shoved down my throat. Um, also, speaking of the moon landing, a hot plug to a documentary called Apollo 11. I think like CNN produced it. Uh, you, can, you can rent it online, but it's all just like awesome raw footage of Apollo 11. Just like walking through the entire process. No interviews, no nothing. Just good, raw footage that you probably haven't seen before. It's hmm. amazing. It'll really put you in a mood. Um, okay, do we like Moon more than we like Superhero? Maybe I still like I Superhero so, more. But... Well, Cork, what do you think? I don't want to rock the boat. I like what you guys like. <laughs> Leo, will you <laughs> effing choose this for us, please? Do the moon one. Do the moon one! All right, Congratulations. Moon. That's Nick from Atlanta. Here we go. Congratulations to uh, the moon landers themselves. We'll put you up on the big board. Hey, uh, stay tuned for an interview with Genova Chen. Uh, let's learn all about the development of Sky, uh, his journey since journey. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. Uh, it'll be a good time. So here's Genova Chen. Nova Chen, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Hi, uh, it's great to be here again. <laughs> it's an honor to have you, man. It's, it's a real treat. Yeah. Uh, Sky, let's see, we're recording this on a Tuesday. Sky is releasing on iOS on Thursday. How are you feeling? How are you feeling two days before the launch of this game? Uh, I'm still noodling some of the shots, you know, some, some final editing, some cuts. Yeah, just uh, procrastinating. Also feeling nervous. Yeah. Nervous? Do you feel like you're you're 
much less nervous when you are actually working on things like a launch trailer and things or trying to find things to, to take up your mind here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I care a lot more about what's in the game. So the stuff I'm working on is still happening in the game. And this is also the first game that uh, I've ever worked on where you can actually continuously update it. You know, where in the old games on console, you release it and it's it's gone. You know, the, the kid's out of your house. You know, you, <laughs> you can't do anything to it. Um, so it is somewhat of a weird situation where you can do a day one, day one patch if you want to. Right. Do you have a roadmap ready to go at this point or are you going to be fully flexible mm -hmm. and see what the feedback is first? Uh, we have a roadmap of, you know, uh, a bunch of features we want to add to the game. And, you know, uh, there will be different seasons. Uh, there's actually a lot of content we have to work on. Um, so, so yeah, we, we say, well, if you can't fix it this build, fix it next season or something like that. Uh, yeah. So you, you say you're nervous uh, about the upcoming launch. What are you nervous about? What are you, what are you scared of uh, with the launch of Sky here? Mm, well, when we made PlayStation games, uh, the focus was uh, very singular, which is we want to shock you with something you've never experienced before, you know, making magic. Uh, uh, you know, whether it's flower or journey, there's a very strong emotional goal that we want to achieve. Uh, but this is this is the first time, you know, we we become independent. Uh, not only do we want to make a game that can touch you, but also we want to prove that artistic games have a market on the, uh, you know, kind of the, the biggest gaming platform today, the mobile market. Um, and because of that, we also have to adopt into the free to start uh, business model, which is there's, you know, a business model we also want to um, prove that could work with an emotional game. Because uh, when we think about a movie, imagine uh, the movie doesn't charge you anything and then somewhere in the middle of a movie, <laughs> they ask you for money. Um, and that's just weird, right? <laughs> so it took us a long time to not, to, not just to make a game, but also to uh, essentially embrace the limitation of mobile platform, uh, but also take advantage of what mobile platform can do that the console game couldn't do. Um, and then tackle with the free to play uh, business and ecosystem. So there's a lot of things going on. Here. There's so much going on. There's so much to unpack. Uh, we've been playing yeah. a little bit of it. My coworker, Matt Miller has, has poured a uh -huh. ton of time into it. And he, he's fascinated by it. And it is just uh -huh. playing at least the opening section. It's such a bizarre, uh -huh blend and I'm trying to wrap my mind around it still about like it starts out and it's like oh this feels a lot more like journey than even uh -huh. I was expecting and then it yeah. starts layering in systems it's like oh they're kind of gamifying and uh you know mobilifying the journey experience and it's a weird uh mesh that I didn't fully see coming is that uh -huh. because that's where your sense of game design is going or is it just hey we have to deal with the mobile market and what people are willing to fund and what investors will back and this is the type of game we need to make I think initially when we set out to do uh, a right after journey it was relatively straightforward which is we want to take an emotional experience to put on the mobile phone where suddenly 10 out of nine, what well, nine out of 10 people who play games on the phone have never touched a console game in the past. And their impression of games, of, of what the game industry is, was limited to what are the mobile games. And we just thought it would be great to uh, share some of the most, you know, cutting edge designs, you know, technologies, you know, music production, you know, a high, high production value game with uh, a bunch of newcomers to the gaming uh, gaming world. Um, and for the first four years when we worked on it, you know, we were, we just think it's gonna be a title we would sell upfront, you know, like uh, uh, Infinity Blade, you know, back in 2014. Um, but then very quickly the market shifted. Uh, there's a flood of free games, right, to the point that the trust we built between console developer and uh, gamers over the past 30 years 
no longer applies, right? Because you have all these people who have never had the trust uh, towards a game developer. And suddenly there's a game that costs three bucks and there's the same game that looking even better that's free, right? So yeah. why would anybody pay any dollar to any games on the phone? Um, and that's the point where we're competing with, you know, everyone who's trying to lower in their uh, initial entry barriers. Um, so, so that is kind of like a big pivot in the middle of uh, the development. Essentially, we made two games. We made a game that would having, uh, I would call it the sequel to Journey um, as a linear experience. Uh, but then the market changed completely where nobody wants to buy any game on the phone. And then we have to change the game so that you can start playing for free. But you know, essentially pay us later. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to change the game quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's such a gorgeous looking game. I feel like mm -hmm. when it eventually comes to consoles, if it comes to PC, it is coming to mm -hmm. other platforms, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's capable of coming to anything, right? <laughs> it's just like where it, it, you know, naturally fits the best. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. is it going to be the same version as uh, like the free to play version on mobile then? Or can you mm -hmm. pivot back to that other game that you say that you built and kind of strip out currencies and things like that? No. So what, what, what happened is we built the premium game as a roller coaster ride. Uh, but now in order to allow people to come in and, you know, uh, build a society, a community here, uh, we changed the roller coaster ride into a theme park. Uh, okay. You know, essentially, you can kind of hang out in the theme park where the roller coaster ride story is still there. You know, if you want to experience it. Um, so we're building just something much more massive, right? Uh, if you want to go scout every single land uh, and find all the secrets, um, it'll take you a long time to play. I mean, I, I never thought I would be making a game beyond two hour long because all, all my past game was like a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that, you know, if you can touch someone with lesser time, you should do that because that's respecting people's uh, time. Um, but as we expanding the roller coaster ride into the theme park, we, lo we start to notice people make friends here. People form community. Uh, people start to use the game as a kind of a virtual chat room, <laughs> uh, and they're just hanging out here. Um, and then we realize that the people who stayed here want things to do. You know, they they don't just want to play a game and see a story, and they just uh, have nothing else to do. So so yeah, it's a. Uh, I would say the the project that definitely had two phases, right? The yeah. storytelling phase and then the theme park phase. Does the so does the theme park phase? Does some of that influence come from like talking to potential investors now that you're independent and just trying to figure out where the money's going to come from to continue development? Mm -hmm. Are you having those discussions with investors of like, can you make this into a living game type of thing? No, it's actually the reverse. I, I'm a biggest fan uh, from Pixar and Disney, and I always wanted to build an uh, online world, a uh, MMO game, which is a virtual theme park. Um, I just didn't know this project will get me all the way over there. <laughs> I just thought, you know, Journey was the first uh, two-player game, one out one, right? So this one will be the small step forward, which would be an eight-player at a time. Uh, but now as the project grow, uh, it st the server start to support more people and the content start to expand. I'm actually like getting to a point where I can say this is a pseudo MMO game. Uh, so the other thing about Disneyland, what I like about is I always wanted to, you know, we grew up with games. Games shaped our life, shaped our views, shaped our friendship, you know, shaped our social lives. And uh, I, I, I love the medium because it, it, to me it's like, a, it's a friend that I grew up with. Uh, as I grew up, uh, a lot of my, you know, real life friends moved on. You know, they say, hey, you know, games are just taking too much time. 
uh, I don't have time for an 80 hour grind just to see a story, right? Which is exactly why I'm making these emotional games in less than two hours because adults are busy. Yeah. You know, and uh, I want to make game relevant to my friends who grew up with games but now don't have times. Um, and then very quickly, uh, you know, after we made Flower Journey, smartphone penetrate everybody's pocket. Suddenly, all these friends who don't have time to play a game now are playing like, you know, Clash Royales or Candy Crush. They, mm -hmm. But they still don't call themselves gamers. You know, their, their view towards game is it was a childhood thing. You know, it's for kids. Um, and so that's why we were looking to these emotional experiences that are still relevant to adults, you know. Yeah. Um, and Journey typically is... I would consider in terms of uh, emotional complexity, it's more like a uh, drama, uh, which tend to be more favored by older people and the younger people like more kind of a direct, uh, straightforward emotion like action, you know, like uh, adventure or like horror. Uh, but as you grow older, you prefer a more mixed, mixed kind of cocktail of emotions like comedy you know like you don't laugh if someone scare you but if someone scare you but then they cuddle you then you you kind of laugh right uh you have to mix emotion together and for drama it's a roller coaster ride of feelings and we can give you a, a cathartic uh, kind of a moment where you can even adults can shed a tear of joy right um and so so that's what I've been focusing on, you know, just how can I make games still relevant to the people around me? Right? How, I can make the game respected by, uh, uh, you know, like, like older societies. Yeah. Um, and so when I set out to do the project after Journey, I was thinking, okay, you know, the only way to make the society to respect games is by making games that is actually enjoyable and and uh, uh, you know, valuable, appreciable uh, towards different groups of uh, you know genders or ages, right? And I thought about all the games that I can make. You know, right now, game industry is very left-handed. You know, pretty much any emotion you find that's popular in the uh, film industry, that's popular about amongst men, has all become very well saturated red ocean in the game market. For example male uh, film market tend to lean towards action and adventure, sci-fi, horror, thriller, uh, documentary. Um, documentary is particularly more interesting to older men, right? So younger men, uh, everything you can see in film is already turned into a video game. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about children, if you think about women, you know, and older adults, um, the, the popular movie genres are like romantic comedy. Uh, I don't think there's a game equivalent of romantic comedy today. Tough, uh, yeah. Yeah, and for example, uh, you know, romance, you know, like Twilight, uh, you know, that equivalent of uh, uh, simulation of being uh, loved by a hot guy or multiple hot guys uh, is a very new, and you know, foreign land in the game industry. And so Sky, uh, recently, oh. in Asia, there are some games that start to uh, kind of become very popular. Uh, it's like dating simulator for teenage girls, uh, and they were very, very popular. Uh, but anyway, I, I want to come back to say that I felt like we can try to tap into all these new markets, the new emotional experiences to, you know, bring more people into playing games and making them love the, the medium. And I thought out of all the emotions, I, I personally find that equivalent emotion of uh, Disneyland or uh, a Disney or Pixar movie um, is still vacant in the game industry. Um, so there are, there are a lot of uh, Saturday morning cartoon equivalent for games. Like they are the uh, child friendly games. You know, you can you can play uh you know, Lego Star Wars, you can play Club Penguin, uh, and Minecraft to some extent, right? But you're not going to expect that for a dad who would play with their kid uh, in, you know, let's say, um, 
Club Penguin. He's going to find something emotional that's going to have a joyful tear uh, in his eye. You know, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and even for a game where a boyfriend and girlfriend can play together, it's very rare because the games are either swing really, really left or really, really right. You know, there isn't a lot of games that is uh, truly attractive to, to both gender uh, or cross uh, generation. Um, so that's why I, I thought if we could bring a whole family together to play games uh, and cr- provide the bonding experience that Journey provides, you know, like after you're playing it, you feel you're closer to someone, um, then that value can be really translated into respect. I think if, yeah. if a family find it bonding the, the people they love together, they can say, I can see why games could be, um, you know, the ninth form of art. Our games can be, uh, you know, positive besides being all the, you know, what the press has been talking about, you know, uh, right, right. Gun, sports, guns, and competitions. Right, yeah, and, for sure. And, uh, and somewhat of a gambling with all these uh, mobile game surprise mechanics. Right? Yes, the surprise uh, mechanics. Is it tough? Yeah. I remember like the long development of Journey. I remember, God, I remember hearing an interview with you on the PlayStation blogcast, I think, in like the early days of that podcast before Journey came out. And it was, it sounded insane to me with you just saying, oh, I want to create a game that feels like a Team Eco game. And I remember just mm-hmm. listening to that and be like, good luck. No one that can call that shot is going to land anywhere near it. And the team pulled it off. So congratulations to you. Uh-huh, but it was fun yes. hearing you on that, in that interview, talk about, you know, kind of being lost in the journey, no pun intended, of development itself. And you could go mm-hmm. so many different directions. I remember you were debating whether or not to just make it motion controlled for a long time there. Mm-hmm. So can you compare being lost in the development wilderness of journey versus sky? Does sky just feel like... <laughs> Because it literally is about two and a half times as, as uh, yeah, yeah. As confusing. Uh, Journey was three years of lost, and at the end of Journey, we were like, we don't want to ever spend three years to make a game ever. <laughs> we want to spend seven. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, uh, yeah. Sky, Sky is, is more like there's double, double lost, right? The first is we need to nail that emotion. The second is the market is shifting and the business is shifting. Um, one of the biggest challenge that the time we put in is we were innovating the games initially, but then we were told that we had to use free to play a uh, uh, business model where everything people point me to look at is filled with kind of uh, aggressive tactics, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and we are a game designer, so I'm super sensitive about how people design their payment system. It's just like very obvious, you know, if you tell me buy one, get one free, you know, you're, you're trying to obscure my sense of how much price really is and makes me feel greedy. Uh, if you say this is a limited deal, you know, if you don't take it next week, it's gone, then there's a fear of missing out. Right. And if you show me, oh, my friend is doing pretty well, you know, it's a s- sense of potential competition or jealousy. And if you um, tell me when I'm gone that the stuff I earned was stolen by someone else, that I have to uh, pay to get it back or to get revenge, it, then it's somewhat of a hatred. So it's like, because w- w- through Journey, we know like a tiny amount of change in terms of what kind of feedback you provide will change people's view on each other. I still remember in Journey when people don't share the resources, uh, the little class thing, people hated each other. They were like, I don't want to play with anybody because they're stealing (laughs) my money, right? Um, And it's just that, you know, it's just a tiny little thing. You, people behave completely different. And so when, I'm aspired to create an emotional experience to bond the family together. And then people are telling me to do gotcha, you know, um, it just doesn't work. You know, how would you feel as a parent to go to a Disneyland and then kids are pulling these, uh, you know, surprise mechanics, you know, 
Well, I guess it does happen in real life. <laughs> but I understand a complicated emotion. It's a weird thing, though, because the, the construct of Sky is trying to convey that emotional experience while also, you know, trying to teach people about currencies. And I think for a lot of mm -hmm. people, that immediately is just a red flag of, all right, mm -hmm. uh, the lights have come on in the museum or the movie theater, and now I have to stop and use a different part of my brain entirely. Like, that must be so yes. difficult to get that right balance of systems versus emotion mm -hmm. and art and beauty. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, even when we were developing on PlayStation for Flower and Journey, having your trophy icon to pop up yes. was a huge disturbing thing. So we were always trying to delay it until you're like back to the menu or after all the things over, then we show you a notification. Um, yeah, I, I would say this is, this seven years, I spent a lot of time doing research and I learned a lot. I mean, if, if there's anything like, I learned a lot of, about you know commerce designs and even just like notification like you have a mobile phone right what do you notify people when do you notify people yeah. how often do you notify people oh it God. was it was like not really a constraint for us to tackle on a playstation um Are although you? right now even playstation start to have all these social media features the, the entire world is moving towards this future where, you know, we are never going to be just watching a TV without another screen going on at the same time, right? Um, so, so yeah, it's it's, it's kind of like embracing that frontier is kind of exciting. So, do, are you fully prepared for? I mean, is the console version of Sky going to be free to play then for every console? Mm, this, I would say, probably not completely free because I mean. It's, it's a lot of money to make this game, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, certainly the console version will have a, a lot more uh, rich and high definition uh, graphics uh, and feedbacks because, you know, on a phone, you're battling with, yeah, I guess the biggest thing I learned between mobile development and console is on console, you want to maximize the usage of power Right, it's, you want to take every single computing you can get from the hardware to give player joy and, and magic. Where on the phone, you kind of have to reserve it because you want the phone to be not too hot where your hands get sweaty. Right. Uh, and then you want the phone to last a bit longer so they can finish playing with somebody <laughs> rather than say, hey, you know what, I, I, I need to reserve my battery, right? I need to. Yeah plug in somewhere or if someone's like in the airport wanting to play the game but if the battery is only 30 percent he's like oh i don't know if i should be playing what if i run out of battery right during the flight um all kinds of concerns so so yeah for for a mobile game we can't really push to uh the extreme on how much we're using the computing power yeah, you, you mentioned, yeah, it costs a lot of money to, to make this game. You've been working on it for a long time. Are you committed to that game company staying indie going into the future? I imagine companies like Microsoft have knocked on your door, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we might be uh, partnering with someone to help us promoting the uh, console version of the game, but oh, essentially okay. the development cost, we paid all the development costs. So uh, it's really depending on how whether we can find the right uh, partner, or in the end, we could also self-publish. Yeah. Uh, we're figuring that out right now. Okay, but you're committed to that game company staying independent as a studio moving into the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. The, um, I gotta ask, the, it's fascinating seeing that game company's catalog of PlayStation games being released on the Epic Game Store and just PC in general. Mm -hmm. I guess everybody's assumed that Sony owned those. Can you talk about that? relationship how that works yeah yeah sony own a hundred percent of those games ip um and for a very long time we were not allowed to bring the game to anywhere uh outside playstation um it it's you know seven years after journey came out um we took a a lot of uh communication back and forth with the sony executives you know I mean, it's, it was game of the year in 2013, so they treated it very differently than you know other games that would have been ported to other platforms. Um, but we all agree that we felt a game like this deserved to be played by more people. Um, and 
it doesn't seem to age much uh, since the subject uh, is very universal. And so Sony made the exception for us to launch it on PC uh, because, you know, it's not a direct competitor uh, with Sony. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that also with Quantic Dream, they also allowed them to, to put mm-hmm. their games on PC. Do you see Sony overall as kind of warming up to the PC market? Mm, that I don't know. I felt like it's more like they, they understand we as a developer uh, could have uh, made more profit if we could have launched on other platforms. And for a very long time, it was limited to uh, one platform only. And, you know, I think it's more like they want to uh, treat us nicely for us to find an alternative uh, uh, place to, you know, sell games and reach more people. Yeah, yeah it's both. It's both money and awareness. Yeah. With, with Sky in general, um, how proud are you feeling about the project? Uh, what, what's, your, what's your level mm-hmm. of pride for this one? Uh, well, so uh, a lot of people ask me how I think about all my games. They were like, oh, is Sky better than Journey? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Yeah, it's like you're asking, you, you know, if you have two kids, like you, you're comparing the two, how do you compare them, right? So I said, uh, so, uh, so Journey was, uh, so, sorry, uh, Flower is the most personal game. It's my favorite game because it's, it's, it's about my life. Uh, Journey is certainly the uh, most well-known game, right? Uh, but Sky is the most ambitious and the biggest budget game. <laughs> you know? Are you feeling good about that? Uh-huh. Oh, sweet. Yeah. What's, what's like the ideal takeaway? It, when players get their hands on, on Sky, what's, what kind of reactions are you hoping for here? Um, I really see Sky as a tool uh, for gamers who love games to share with their friends and family who might have like a second guess about what gaming is uh, and, and bring them into experiencing games and hopefully loving games. Uh, that's really the, the reason I, I made Sky and I put it on the phone because nobody's going to buy a second PlayStation to play Journey with you. <laughs> right? Try to convince any of your family member to buy a PlayStation. Impossible. Right, right? So, so I wanted to lower the barrier so they already have a mobile device or maybe in the future a laptop or something that you could, you could say, hey, you know, uh, let's, let's go have an adventure in this magical land, right? And before there'd be all kinds of excuses, right? But now it's like, here, let me just download it for you. <laughs> Boom, launch the game. Here, I'm here, let's go, right? <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I wanted to make that barrier as low as possible, but at the same time to provide a family-friendly experience. You know, there's no killing here, there's no sex or gambling here, and it's something that you should be feel proud to show your family and don't, you know, nothing shameful about this, you know, there's, there's nothing, yeah, it's, it's really hard. I mean, it's so easy to sell something using the, the what I was saying earlier, you know, we know sex sells, you know, it even works in Hollywood. We know gambling sells, right? And we wanted to do something that doesn't rely on that, right? So that we can earn respect and love uh, to, to, to the game industry. That's, that's what Sky is for. That's, that's a hell of a mission, man. Uh, so mm-hmm. other than Sky, uh, what have you been playing lately? What, what games have you been uh, keeping busy with? Uh, I've been playing mostly actually mobile games lately. Really? Uh, yeah. I've, uh, not even the, the like super successful ones. Like I'm, I'm playing the remake of uh, Command and Conquer on a mobile version. Oh no. Yeah. Really? I feel like the yeah. internet is wincing hearing you say that. Like, what have you become, yeah. man? <laughs> yeah. It's like I, I, I used to play uh, MOBA. But then as I grow older, I have kids now, right? The time for a MOBA was like 45 minutes to an hour. And if you lose a game and you have to play it again until you win, right? The, the, the interval is too, too long. Like if I play two MOBA games, that's two hours. That's 
pretty much gone. I can imagine the kids and my wife are going to be very angry at me. <laughs> I'd imagine auto right. chess falls in that same camp for you then? Right. So what happened is then I was switching to uh, Heroes of Storms, which is like uh, 15 to 20 minutes around. Uh, but then later I'm switching to like something that's even shorter, like two to five minutes around, right? And which is like the Clash of Clan, uh, the Command and Conquer uh, kind of game. Because, yeah, I mean, as we grow older and older, the time we have, I mean, if I want to play, I mean, I still play Dark Souls and, uh, you know, some of these like favorite games from the old times, like, I certainly would play a Final Fantasy remake, right? <laughs> uh, but I have to like make it a special event. I have to like, you know, get excuse, you know, book up on my schedule to play those games, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, which is also kind of like as I was making Sky, I started to realize, man, you know, like, how can I still keep the game relevant even to myself, right? Like, which game would I play? Um, I could, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I, it's kind of crazy to think I'm close to 40 now. You know, it's just felt like yesterday when I graduated from college and how much life changes, you know. Um, I remember like maybe 15 years ago, we were saying the average gamer's age is like 35 years old. Does that make now the average gamer's age to become 50? <laughs> Uh, There's a lot of newcomers coming in, man. This Fortnite game, it's it's apparently quite good. I don't know. Right. So all it does it mean the people who go above 35 is basically not playing games anymore? Yeah, I don't know. You know? Yeah. How old are you? Uh, 32. All right. You still got some years going there. Yeah, it's working. Uh, all right, obviously uh, Skype uh, completely crapped the bed there, but you're back. But the point is, it's tough to make time for for games these days. But I wanted to ask you, with the uh, name with the name Genova, uh, what are your thoughts on the Final Fantasy VII remake? What are you hoping for from the Final Fantasy VII remake? I think it's more like how I felt towards Lion King remake. Oh no! Have you seen the Rotten <laughs> Tomato scores? <laughs> so I didn't see it because I I cherished the memory I had, and uh, I mean super realistic blanking does look very visually rich but i just don't have the i i must i'm scared that it will ruin my memory yeah uh, well, yeah so i didn't watch it i'm i'm trying to just wait until see people to tell me whether it's it's better or you know it's not worth watching for final fantasy i think it's going to be the same you know, I'm going to wait until all the, you know, everybody's going to be reviewing it. And if they tell us that, you know, it's the same, uh, you know, then I probably wouldn't play it. What did you think of like Advent Children? Do you feel like that tarnished your memory at all of the original game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> see, you, you, you know, this is the same thing people from Harry Potter or Game of Thrones, you know, that saw of Ice and Fire, they would say the book is always better than the, the movie. Right. You know? And, yeah, but I, as a game developer, I'm quite curious to see, like, how many upgrades are they going to do to your experience from a different time, you know? It's and pretty that, that's interesting to me. Yeah. Do you have any uh, hopes or do's and don'ts? If you could convey a message to Square right now, like what you want them to do with the <laughs> with the creature, the, the entity of Genova versus what you don't want them to do? Yeah, so in the writing, uh, Genova doesn't have gender, uh, but in the original game, I think it does look like a mother, right? Mm -hmm. looks like a female. Um, but, you know, I, I would certainly hope that they do. Uh, they 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 have a better design this time. <laughs> oh, you don't want the eye on the boob anymore, Genova? <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually don't remember that detail. Oh, okay. It was uh, really low resolution back then. On the yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of had a lot of imagination, you know, because back then the resolution is low. Um, and at, at the time when I played the game, I don't really speak very good English. So I played the English version. A lot of the dialogue I don't necessarily understand to its full. So like a lot of the experience was filled with my own imagination, you know. Interesting. Uh, but 
I guess the the raw emotion of lost someone who you have, you know, uh, teamed up, uh, leveled up together, built up like a 20 to 30 hour of experience, you know, and eventually losing someone, that is uh, universal, uh, this, the sense of loss. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I would say that if the character is more realistic, like if they have a good voice actor or actress, I would argue that people probably will feel less about the loss mm -hmm. because they know that, was a, that that is a fictional character. It's an actor or actress uh, versus someone who speaks not many, uh, not much, right? And then you project so much of yourself into it. It's like the, the girl from Michael, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, versus, I mean, the other one that's really well done is like uh, uh, Bioshock Infinite, right? You know, but I, I personally, I felt like I, I care less about losing her than losing the girl from Michael because it, I put a part of myself into the character. Mm -hmm. Where the character in the Bioshock is more like she's convenient, she's helpful, she's, you know, essentially a buff, right? Like I, I appreciate the buff, right? <laughs> uh, but losing the buff isn't losing a part of myself, you know? Yeah. So. I, I feel like maybe this time I will feel the same way towards, uh, you know, the Final Fantasy moment. Right, right. Do you, uh, has anybody from Square ever talked to you about your name? Has it ever come up? Like, what's the strangest place <laughs> where, where the name has come up? Uh, no, not really. Nobody really uh, from the company reached out to me. Why, why, why couldn't I name myself the Khaleesi, right? I mean, there's like, what, 500 people's name Khaleesi or something, right, from <laughs> Game of Thrones. Nobody's going to sue you, your, yeah. your individual. Oh, no, not to, be, yeah. not to be sued, but just like, hey, we're a fan of your games, and it's kind of fun that you have the name from our game. I just was waiting for some weird connection that way, but all right, apparently not. I was, <laughs> I was delighted one time uh, interviewing Mark Cerny. We were talking about you, and he's a big fan of Journey. And I was really tickled uh -huh. pink that Mark Cerny, of all people, was like, yeah, Genova, that's a Final Fantasy VII character, right? Like, he just happened to know that trivia. And it's like, I love the idea of Mark Cerny mm -hmm. knowing who Genova is in the game. That's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most people don't know. I mean, in my, I mean, I've been using this name ever since 15 years ago or something, when I first came to America. I think only, like, three people said, hey, I know Genova. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, nobody knows this name. Yeah. Do a lot of people say Jehovah? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, some people start to ask me the meaning of the name. And so I actually went back to do research why the name was originally created uh, by Square. And they were, I mean, to my surprise, I didn't understand the meaning back when well, I picked the name, but to my surprise, they were actually using Jehovah uh, but they want to kind of, you know, like, I guess it was a uh, gothic punk, right? Like, that's what that's what Final Fantasy is. So they want to, like, like, you know, kind of slay the gods, right? They, so they, they say Jehovah plus Nova, you know, which is the, you know, a new star is born, right? So right. it's like Jehova. And I was like, wow, that's a very uh, blasphemy name. You know, like I didn't know that when I picked the name. So, uh, <laughs> And now you've had a full career of just blowing up the gods of gaming out there, man. <laughs> uh, that's what Kratos do. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's confusing. Yeah, the Sony Santa Monica connection, it's, it's a mess. Well, hey, uh, Sky, congratulations on the game finally coming out. Uh -huh. And now this is just, it's almost the start of your sprint, right? Now that you've made a living game, you're committed to this thing. Yeah, uh, so the game will be out in two days on iOS, and uh, uh, eventually it will come out to Android, PC, and console. Do you have any sort so, of timeline you can share with for any of those? Uh, well, I, I guess we will share with you when the date is becoming solidified, right? But uh, certainly, I think uh, there will be quite a few platforms available this year. Quite a uh, few. Okay, so off of yeah. mobile this year. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Well, hey, congratulations to the team. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time, man. Really nice appreciate talking it. to you. Absolutely. And thank you for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show podcast. Be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Bye.